The committee will come to order. Just one year ago, U.S. contractors and Army engineers put the finishing touches on a highly touted renovation to the maternity hospital in Erbil, northern Iraq. The $6.8 million project promised to convert the dilapidated hospital into a modern, state-of-the-art medical facility. Today, the backed-up drainage system spews disgusting water through many of the hospital's floor drains, water contaminated by used syringes, drug vials, and bandages, an incinerator necessary for medical waste disposal lies idle because the workers initially trained to operate it are no longer employed by the hospital. The new water purification system is broken. Hospital workers use dangerous and unstable old oxygen tanks rather than the improved system installed by U.S. contractors simply because they do not feel adequately trained on the new high-tech system. This is just one of scores of projects among the many so-called completed reconstruction projects in Iraq that are now literally crumbling. These are the projects we handed off with so much fanfare. It is simply outrageous that we are mired in the same mud of incompetence that we got stuck in last year and the year before that. But knowing the administration's abysmal track record on Iraq reconstruction planning, this is no surprise. One of the early bungles in planning for reconstruction involved financing. If we had started on a path that offered the Iraqis real incentives in rebuilding their country, today's pitiful state of affairs might be different. In the fall of 2003, just as the reconstruction effort was beginning, the distinguished chairman of our Appropriations Committee, David Obi, and I co-sponsored an amendment to provide half of the reconstruction funding as loans and the other half as grants. The loans would have ensured that the Iraqis had a real stake in the success of infrastructure projects and would have encouraged them to fulfill their obligations quickly. Iraqis would have been motivated to take ownership over the rebuilding of their own country. But the administration and the Republican-led Congress stonewalled our loan plan, which incidentally would have preserved some of the reconstruction monies for the U.S. taxpayers who have been paying through the nose every day. There is no accountability. The Iraqis who secure these contracts can essentially take the money and run. Many of them have done just that, as described again and again in the reports of our distinguished witness, Stuart Bowen, the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. And some U.S. contractors who have lined their pockets with taxpayer dollars are not accountable to anyone either. This stunning mismanagement seems to be why many of the endeavors are executed so shoddily. The revelation in Mr. Bowen's latest quarterly report that new facilities are crumbling is equally as troubling as the data on incomplete projects. Some of the supposedly completed ventures are actually houses of cards ready to collapse. In a sampling of eight projects across different sectors, Mr. Bowen's office found that seven were no longer operating as originally designed. 
The culprits on the ground apparently include plumbing and electrical failures, lack of proper maintenance, outright looting, and expensive equipment lying idle. But the real blame lays at the feet of the administration. The president did not follow the sage rule of his former Secretary of State. If you break it, you own it. The administration instead applied some weak glue and then hoped against hope it would not fall to pieces. This situation is beyond unacceptable. It is serious misconduct. But we must be forward-looking now. And the only way to plan adequately for the future is to ascertain the most accurate state of the present. That is why it is so crucial that the Office of the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction brings an unvarnished, independent, and enormously useful viewpoint on the rebuilding of Iraq. Let me just review a few of the startling facts Mr. Bowen has uncovered in his latest report. I do this not as an academic exercise or to erect a fruitless scoreboard, but to underscore the vast improvement we need to make in so many aspects of Iraq's reconstruction. Iraq loses perhaps $5 billion a year to the waste created by corruption. Only eight primary health centers have been opened, nowhere near the original goal of 150. The country has the capacity to produce just two and a half million barrels of oil a day. Our original goal and promise four years ago was over three million. Water projects have made drinkable water available to only five and a half million of the eight and a half million people who had been expected to receive it. With these kinds of gaps, there are clearly massive failures throughout the construction, implementation, and management of projects in all of the sectors. It is plainly apparent that the Iraqis are not getting the basic services they need and are not being trained to obtain them. An axiom of development aid says that if you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, but if you teach him how to fish, he'll eat for the rest of his life. When it comes to Iraqi reconstruction, we have not even stocked the pond, let alone taught the Iraqis how to fish. We must make sure that future plans include training the Iraqis to maintain their societies not just fill it with fly-by-night facilities that soon deteriorate or become obsolete. It's now my pleasure to t turn to my distinguished colleague, the committee's ranking member, and my good friend, Ileana ross Leighton, to make any comments she wishes to make. Thank you, as always, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and thank you especially for calling this uh, important and timely hearing. Uh, serious errors have uh, been made and continue to be, make, to be made in the reconstruction process. And we must learn from these and achieve long-term reconstruction goals, which are directly intertwined with long-term security and stability objectives. Uh, we must work to increase the ability of the Iraqi government to provide adequate jobs, water, fuel, and electricity. Other issues that must be considered as part of any assessment concerning the future direction of reconstruction efforts are the root causes of the high rates of absenteeism within the security forces, poor interior ministry reporting, inadequate vetting mechanisms to prevent sectarian and militia influences from infiltrating Iraqi security forces, inadequate systems to account for personnel, and inexperienced staff with limited budgeting and technology skills. Both security ministries have difficulties acquiring, distributing, and maintaining weapons, vehicles, and equipment. Uh, I have had the opportunity of, of uh, having met with uh, Mr. Bowen in, in the past, and I have uh, great respect and admiration for the work that, that he has done. I hope that in his uh, remarks uh, this morning, he can comment on the performance of the Iraqi security forces, including the Army, National Police, and Iraqi police, based on 
uh, your uh, observation from your uh, most recent trip uh, to Iraq. Uh, how are the security assistance programs adapting to this new environment uh, as a result of the Baghdad security plans? Uh, Iraq will also continue to require U.S. and international support, including political and economic incentives to strengthen its government institutions, to eliminate corruption, to stimulate employment, and deliver essential services. And I hope that uh, our, uh, our witness will elaborate on the recommendations, Mr. Bowen, that you have made in the March 2007 report regarding the development of multi-year programs and financing strategies that accommodate both short-term and long-term programs. If we are to achieve the desired result, uh, we must approach reconstruction efforts in an integrated manner. And uh, I know that uh, you're going to be talking to us about the recommendations to better integrate uh, uh, these uh, relevant U.S. agencies. Uh, and uh, one of the items that was discussed was a, a Goldwater Nichols type approach to uh, reform. In assessing the lessons learned from our experience in post-conflict reconstruction in Iraq, we must improve our programs to ensure a stable, secure, free Iraq that will be a partner for the United States in fighting Islamic militants in the region and beyond. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and I thank, thank our, our witness uh, for appearing before thank us. You. Thank you very much, and pleased to recognize my friend from New York, Chairman Ackerman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two months ago, Mr. Bowen appeared before a joint hearing of the Middle East and South Asia and International Organizations Human Rights and Oversight Committees and told us that he was cautiously optimistic regarding reconstruction efforts in Iraq. Two months later, I'm not sure that I share uh, Mr. Bowen's optimism. Two months ago, the Iraqi government was still not producing either oil or electricity at rates that matched pre-war performance, nor were they able to spend a significant amount of money, of the money they had budgeted, to improve either situation. Two months later, the same can still be said. And last week, the Government Accountability Office reported that over the last four years, between 100,000 and 300,000 barrels of oil a day went unaccounted for. I used to have a car like that. It's just gone. GAO figures at an average price of $50 per barrel. That amounts to somewhere between $5 and $15 million a day that may have been stolen, siphoned, or more likely not even produced. What the GAO has uncovered here is that neither the Iraqis nor we know precisely how much oil is being produced. After having spent more than $2 billion of the American taxpayers' money on rebuilding Iraq's oil infrastructure, you'd think that we'd at least know how much oil was being produced. Since oil revenue makes up 95 percent of Iraq's income, and since oil production is one of the milestones we're using to measure reconstruction progress, it seems to me that precision in this regard would be something of a priority. On the upside, I suppose it is possible that Iraq is actually producing much more oil than we thought or than they reported, but somehow I doubt it. So for the past four years, Iraq has actually been missing its oil production targets by a lot more than we had previously thought. Similar situation in the electricity sector, but at least there the Iraqis seem to be able to measure how much electricity is being produced. The only problem is that it is simply nowhere near enough. Three billion dollars later, and Baghdad still has less electricity before the war. The Iraqis have had the same target for producing electricity since it was established by the CPA in 2004 and have fallen consistently short. There are lots of reasons for both these situations as well as the other areas where reconstruction has fallen short, like the lack of enough clean drinking water or the many hospitals and clinics that have been refurbished but lack enough doctors to provide care. The total absence of anything like a passive security environment has to be at the top of anyone's list as the chief culprit for Reconstruction's failing. And while Mr. Bowen makes a valid point about other projects having been successfully competed, completed until the big things get done and done right, the little things don't count for enough. So 
Mr. Bowen's uh, cautious optimism notwithstanding, uh, four years into our ill-conceived effort to reconstruct Iraq, uh, this social studies teacher would give it an F. Thank you, Mr. Ackerman. The gentleman from California, Mr. Orbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate both your words and uh, those of Ranking Member Ileana ross Layton. Uh, there's much wisdom in both of them. Uh, I think that if there's any uh, blame that we can have about things we haven't done totally right in, uh, in this committee in the past, I think the criticism in the past that we have not had as much um, of an emphasis on this type of oversight, I think, would be justified criticism. And uh, uh, so I'm very pleased that the chairman now is taking steps to make sure that we are uh, a player in making the decisions to make sure that our money is not being wasted. Uh, Mr. Bowen, I know who you are, and I, we've spoken. I respect mm -hmm. you, and I thank you, thank you. Uh, for the serious job that you're doing and the responsible job that you're doing. Uh, dealing with corruption and incompetence uh, is not an easy job in the middle of a conflict. And I will just say, Mr. Chairman, that I've seen this firsthand uh, in various conflicts that I've been involved with one way or the other. And uh, people on your side who are trying to create a better world uh, against an evil enemy, uh, perhaps many of them sometimes turn out to be corrupt and you don't know what to do about it. And other times they are incompetent and you don't know what to do about it because you're fighting of an evil enemy and you don't know how to, how to make it work, mm -hmm. even though you're, the goal is noble. I think that may be what's going on in Iraq today. Um, and I appreciate this hearing to make sure we can delve into that and have a deeper understanding and perhaps correct some of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gen gentle lady from California, Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And I welcome Mr. Bowen back from Iraq. Glad to see you're back safely. Thank you. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. From the start, we have sought to solve a political challenge without any thoughtful, comprehensive political strategy. And the result is the situation we find ourselves in today. All of us would like to see Iraq become a democracy. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, our own actions have hobbled this effort. The foundations of democracy are transparency and accountability, yet in Iraq, we have only shown the Iraqis how not to build these foundations. Our contracts and reconstruction plans for Iraq are opaque, with no bid and cost plus contracts being the norm. The CPA under Paul Bremer managed to misplace $9 billion, that's right, billion with the B, and the U.S. government officials in charge of these failures have still not been held accountable by this administration. Mr. Chairman, these are terrible examples for the fledging Iraqi government and to people who are looking towards us as to how to do a democracy the right way. These are the bitter fruits of the arrogance and the willfully ignorant approach to this war from the beginning. I applaud you, Mr. Bowen, for your efforts to root out fraud, waste, and abuse in our reconstruction efforts. But despite your talents, we cannot find what is the most sorely needed thing in Iraq. And what it is, and is an effective political strategy for disengaging our forces and re-engaging our partners until we can build up their democracy so it is functional, we should not invest uh, our own taxpayers' dollars. So thank you, Mr. Bowen, for going there and uh, gathering the facts and bringing them back to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Rakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll waive my opening statement and look forward to the testimony. Gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the hearing and the ranking member as well. I appreciate the oversight role that this uh, committee has taken uh, in the 110th Congress. Mr. Bowen made mention of the fact that he spent a number of uh, years or good times in Texas, and for that I appreciate him even more. Uh, and I know, frankly, that he understands how to make things work. Uh, this uh, hearing will probably exhibit a lot of peaking uh, frustration, having gone to Iraq for the first time under the jurisdiction or the administration of Paul Bremer and hearing a lot of glorious accolades as to what was going to happen and now seeing that uh, the mountaintop really truly was not that. One of the big mistakes, of course, was um, I call the word hoarding, uh, meaning that as we had some glimmer of hope in the early stages right after the war when Paul Bremer was there, many of us argued vigorously that we embrace uh, the uh, help uh, that was offered by the neighbors, our surrounding Mideast neighbors, the help, Arabic speakers in fact, the help that uh, the European Union was trying to, to offer so that not only could there be uh, an expanded uh, spread of the amount of resources necessary, but there could be added stakeholders. And why is that relevant to this whole issue of reconstruction? Because frankly, as you make your presentation, the world sees that the failure of Iraq in its non-reconstruction falls heavily on the shoulders of the United States. And our heavy emphasis on the Iraqi national uh, police and national forces, $15.5 billion, uh, their failure to adequately be uh, seemingly able to, to rise to the occasion, all uh, is emphasized, uh, if you will, all is emphasized uh, on us. And so my uh, concern as you make your presentation is whether or not there is a future, whether or not there is hope in terms of what you have been able to find. Mm -hmm. I thank the chairman for this. Uh, my frustration is peaking. I think it has been a complete failure, and I think the administration is on the wrong track. I hope, however, that for the people of Iraq, we'll find a way to provide them with a better quality of life. I yield back. Gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tancredo. I have no opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Miller. I will pass on my opening statement. Gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Barrett. Gentle lady from California, Ms. Woolsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We shouldn't be in Iraq in the first place. We've destroyed a sovereign nation, their economy, and their infrastructure. We continue to uh, stay and embolden the insurgents uh, who continue the destruction. What we should be doing is uh, bringing our troops home safely, investing only in their safe return home, and then investing in helping Iraq rebuild its nation, but not militarily, helping them through non-military means. Uh, that as far as I'm concerned, is the only way we'll get uh, the corruption out of the system. Uh, we need to uh, give the Iraqis the pride in their own nation. We need to support them in their re rebuilding, and we need, in turn, to add to their economy. We have to stop the drain of U.S. dollars going to corrupt U.S. Uh, contractors, and uh, it's just a shame that we've we're there in the first place. But we can do this, but we can't do it by, and I'll say this later in my remarks, by having legislation that has benchmarks on the Iraqi government that will then in turn uh, punish them by taking away any of their re reconstruction dollars when we're the ones that are there uh, destroying their country along with their insurgents, but we're emboldening the whole process. It's, it's a closed circle. We have to stop this. I thank you. The gentlelady from Arizona, Ms. Giffords. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to hear from Mr. Bowen today, and I also appreciate the testimony that, that you've provided and you're going to talk about in terms of this really critical, critical, critical issue, mm -hmm. which is the Iraqi reconstruction. We've spent about $35 billion, United States, on reconstruction efforts so far in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, we've lost um, over 3,000 soldiers with about 25,000 other soldiers being wounded. 
when an, our forces went into Iraq, we went in swiftly and decisively, and of course we removed Saddam Hussein. But unfortunately, since that time, we've seen that the civilian leadership in Iraq has failed to win the peace and, and helped to really build a secure, stable environment in order to help with the reconstruction efforts. Just considering the news stories from the last 48 hours, at least 25 people were killed and 60 wounded when a car bomb exploded near a popular market in the Emil district of southwestern Baghdad. At least four college students were killed in the last 48 hours and 25 wounded in a mortar attack at a college in northern Baghdad. And then two bodies of airport workers in the Arbil area were shot and found tortured um, near the, the town of, or in the town of Ramadi. When I look at the, the provincial reconstruction efforts that are taking place in Afghanistan compared to the efforts that are taking place in Iraq, I think we can learn some real lessons. Um, unfortunately, we have not in, been able to really engage with the Iraqi culture, the Iraqi people to the same degree that um, we have a cultural understanding and a better relationship with the Afghanis. In my home district in Arizona, I have Fort Huachuca, which is an army intelligence center, which precisely trains on on this issue, cultural understanding, language understanding, awareness. So I'm, I'm hoping to hear from Mr. Bowen um, what additional steps we can take to better understand the culture, to, um, to have a, a better sense of the dollars that we're spending, um, why they're not working in comparison to Afghanistan. Um, when I had a chance in February to go visit Iraq, although briefly, um, I heard from General Petraeus, General Phil, General Wolf, General Odierno, they said, we will know in the surge, it said that it said not days, not weeks, not years, but months. And of course, you know, that was five months ago. And with all of the violence we've seen now, just, you know, in the, well, it just, it never ends. Um, you know, I'd, I'd really like to have a candid mm -hmm. discussion from you in terms of, you know, where are we going here? And um, you know, really, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Because it seems to me that the plans that have been put in place by the present administration simply aren't working. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Pence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for calling uh, this hearing so provocatively titled uh, uh, with such a uh, distinguished and uh, um, and, and well known for his candor uh, witness before this uh, panel. Um, Mr. Bowen, I appreciate your service um, you. and your efforts to safeguard taxpayer dollars in particular and to highlight areas where we need to improve our efforts. Reform, transparency, and best practices are good medicine for any government, uh, whether it's one year old in the case of Iraq or 231 years old. Uh, Mr. Bowen's 16 trips to Iraq have shed enormous uh, light on the challenges there and how we can improve our delivery of aid, and I, I, I commend you for that. I share probably uh, everyone in this body's concern about the fact that the government of Iraq has not expanded, expended rather, such a, a large percentage of its capital budget. Uh, your findings uh, put it at about 18 percent of their budget expended. Um, but of course, the 100 percent of salaries uh, mm -hmm. have been distributed. Uh, clearly, this must improve, and Iraq's leaders must show progress in this area. I, I additionally am concerned about the corruption highlighted in the oil industry. Uh, uh, your testimony estimates that about one-seventh of the oil uh, export may be lost because of smuggling and fraud. Um, that is an astonishing um, uh, figure, and, uh, uh, and one that I, I hope we hear more about in context of your testimony. Uh, but that being said, we shouldn't lose sight uh, of the forest for the trees. I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Bowen's direct answer to the question posed in our hearing today, is reconstruction failing? He says, and I quote, the short answer is, quote, no, close quote. We are not failing and we will not fail if we, as the old book says, faint not, in my judgment. Mr. Bowen's testimony makes clear that the sticking point for much of our efforts and the Iraqi government's efforts is the security situation. Without basic security, reconstruction efforts face long odds. I'm personally optimistic about the direction our efforts have taken under the new leadership of General Petraeus and the surge. I believe it is critical that this Congress um, uh, give him the tools he needs to succeed. Where reconstruction and security meet is in the Commander's Emergency Response Program 
which allows local projects at the discretion of small unit leaders. I wholeheartedly support this effort. I had occasion to be briefed on the preliminary progress being made by our troops in Ramadi and to Creed on a congressional delegation there last month. CERP projects are critical tools in their efforts to stabilize the country. Mr. Chairman, I also appreciate Mr. Bowen's efforts to give credit where credit is due. His testimony makes it clear that, that various entity, entities, notably the multinational forces Iraq, improved uh, their product in consultation with his efforts, and I appreciate that. Uh, despite the fact that there are setbacks, challenges, and shortfalls, I believe, and trust we will hear some today, that there is good news in Iraq. I thank our witness for his efforts in improving and reforming our mm -hmm. efforts in that country, and I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for the vision of calling this hearing. I yield back. Thank you very much. We are fortunate to have with us today the person with the greatest expertise on Iraq reconstruction. Mr. Stuart Bowen is the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. In that role, since October 2004, Mr. Bowen has uncovered enormous waste, fraud, and corruption and abuse in the Iraq reconstruction process. He serves an essential oversight function because only with full and open disclosure of what has gone wrong can we hope to improve our rebuilding efforts. Mr. Bowen has a long and distinguished legal and Republican political career, and he previously served as Inspector General for uh, the Coalition Provisional Authority. He has just returned from another trip to Iraq, and we are very interested to hear his observations. Mr. Bowen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank the nice lady who just refilled my glass, who, my mother who is with us this morning. So hey. thank you. Well, may, may, I, may I interrupt you for a moment? Yes. Uh, Ms. Bowen, it's pleasure meeting you and we commend you for having done a very good job <laughs> in bringing up a great public servant. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for those kind words. Uh, Chairman Lantos, Ranking Member Ross Leighton, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to report to you on the continuing work of the Office of the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. The title of this hearing poses the question, as Mr. Pence just noted, is reconstruction failing? The short answer is no, but it must be put in context as every report I issue puts in context, as our lessons learned reports put in context. That is that the reconstruction program in Iraq has been fraught with challenge, a mixture of success and failure, shortfalls and, and, uh, and successful projects achieved. Much has been accomplished with the $21 billion of, uh, that comprise the, the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, the very generous grant program that this Congress approved uh, three and a half years ago. Countless facilities have been built, and, and the Iraqis uh, have been receiving these facilities over the past year, but that process has been fraught with challenges itself, as our audits and our recent inspections that you pointed out, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, reveal. Permit me also to begin by paying tribute to the dedicated, the many dedicated Americans, Iraqis, and other coalition partners who have strived and continue to strive in incomparably dangerous conditions to advance Iraq's economic and political recovery. And the challenges are enormous, as everyone here knows. Uh, there, there have been notable accomplishments with the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, but the challenges I just alluded to are numerous, foremost among them. Uh, trying to execute a reconstruction program in an unstable security environment. This is not the Marshall Plan. This is a reconstruction program conducted virtually under fire. And that means every project has cost more than expected and has taken longer to complete, and a lot of projects have not been finished. The primary reason is the security situation. There's, there's no uh, gainsaying that reality. But there are other problems, as we pointed out. Poor interagency planning and coordination, especially in the efforts early stages, uh, must be rectified uh, over time. Uh, 
uh, uh, Ranking Member Ross Layton and alluded to the important reforms that needed to be addressed as we identified in our most recent Lessons Learned report on program and project management. Uh, a beyond Goldwater Nichols reform is what I've called it. And what that means is promoting integration among the agencies that are tasked with protecting U.S. interests abroad, the Department of State, USAID, the Department of Defense. These are the agencies that have the lead in post-conflict contingency relief and reconstruction management. And the story of Iraq reconstruction, if it says anything, is that the integration of that process needs work. Inconsistent and poorly managed contracting practices have also been a challenge. Our contracting lessons learned reports details that. It's also a story of gradual improvement. Again, multiple agencies operating with multiple contracting regulations uh, and employing varying databases presented a huge challenge for me when I first arrived in Iraq three years ago and tried to begin to take account of what contracting was going on. And our first few audits identified that what was going on was poorly staffed and the systems were, were poorly put together and it's been a gradual recovery from that difficult start. It's much better today under the Joint Contracting Command Iraq uh, weak program and project oversight, especially re with respect to quality assurance and quality control programs. Uh, quality assurance is the government's job to, m to uh, make sure that there's somebody there overseeing the contractor who's enforcing quality control at a project site. Both areas have had weaknesses. Our, our most recent Lessons Learned report details some of those, but frankly, so do our 90 inspections and our, our 86 audits. Uh, that, that, uh, that is an area of reform that's necessary. Uh, and finally, insufficient systems for effective human capital management. That was our first Lessons Learned report uh, issued almost two years ago now. Uh, simply identifies the need to develop a civilian reserve corps uh, in, to, to in parallel with, the, with uh, our military reserve corps, a, a team that's trained and ready to go and exercises post-conflict relief and reconstruction programs. And, and our second recommendation in our latest Lessons Learned report echoes one that, that, that I have made to this Congress and in previous reports, and that is the funding of SCRS, the entity uh, created by NSPD 44, uh, to manage this process. The, the, the entity needs authority and appropriations before it, it can, uh, can robustly address this important matter. Uh, I just returned from my 16th trip to Iraq. I spent 10 days there and, and uh, it was a palpably uh, dangerous environment. Uh, it's, there, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, I met with the key leadership uh, in the Iraq Reconstruction Program and, um, and addressed our latest findings in our quarterly report, which was issued three weeks ago. Um, uh, the, um, the U.S. program, as that report points out, is moving beyond the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund. That's an important message to continue to articulate for this reason. The United States no longer bears the preponderant burden for financing the recovery of Iraq. That burden rests squarely on the shoulders of the Iraqi government, and it's why that budget execution matter that uh, Mr. Pence raised uh, is so critical. Uh, last year, uh, the, the Iraqi government simply did not execute its capital budget program effectively, most notably in the Ministry of Oil, arguably the, the, uh, the, the most critical uh, economic uh, ministry. Oil generates 94 percent of Iraq's budget, 75 percent of its GDP, and it spent a fraction, a tiny fraction of, of its capital budget last year. Nine percent of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund was invested in that oil sector because it was assumed that Iraq would be able to begin funding itself. Well, it hasn't uh, four years on, and that, that, must, that gap must be closed. The budget execution initiative is ongoing. Ambassador Carney is pushing it. There are consequences that are putting in, being put in place over there, but they must be applied. Uh, Iraq must spend its capital budgets. Uh, the, uh, the U.S. effort now, as it moves beyond the earth, will increasingly focus on targeted support to specific programs aimed at furthering capacity development within the Iraqi system. Most notable among these programs is the Provincial Reconstruction Team Initiative, which began just over a year ago and has significantly expanded uh, this year. Uh, Sigur issued an, an audit of that initial plan last October and found uh, some problems in resources, staffing, and security. 
The security issue is still there, but resources and staffing uh, uh, of the original 10 PRTs uh, have, have, have made progress. The 10 new embedded PRTs, which are just standing up uh, and, are Im and are embedded with brigade, military brigades and under direction of the brigade commander, are a novel new evolution of this program. Uh, the whole program uh, is designed to build governance out at the provincial level, and especially in Baghdad. Four of these new EPRTs are in Baghdad. They're a bit of a misnomer drawn, the, calling them provincial reconstruction teams, since their focus really is on governance capacity building, which includes reconstruction as just a component. We will prov provide a review of the current PR, of the, of the of our past audit of the PRT program in the next quarterly report, and the following report will provide a detailed audit of the embedded PRTs. Uh, SIGR has, uh, as, Mr. Ch as Chairman Lantos uh, pointed out, issued a series of inspection reports in this latest quarterly that, that uh, raise concerns, rightfully so. Uh, the, the asset transfer process is something that we've audited before. There was a process put in place within Iraq worked out between the mission and the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Planning, but it has not been followed. We are in the midst of doing a, uh, another audit of that process, and that will be out in our next quarterly report, updating uh, the reality on the ground in Iraq with respect to asset transfer. But sustainability of, the, of, of what the United States has constructed and turned over to Iraq is really what I was trying to get at when I sent my inspectors out across Iraq to look at projects that had been done at least six months by the time they visited the site. And, and uh, frankly, uh, uh, there were some troubling things turned up. You, you identified the Erbil uh, Maternity Hospital as one, Mr. Chairman, but the, the, the Baghdad International Airport, um, uh, 10 generators provided to, to, uh, to, uh, to provide the 18 megawatts of power that j that airport needs to operate effectively weren't working and haven't worked. The two GE energy generators that are, that are top of the line simply have not worked since, since installed. Uh, that the uh, responsible agencies are addressing that on the ground now, but, uh, but that's, that raises concerns. Uh, the, the, uh, the two key programs uh, I think for targeted support moving forward are the PRT program, as we've talked about, and the Commander's Emergency Response Program. Uh, that, that provides funding to maneuver commanders on the ground in Iraq uh, to execute quick turnaround projects that, that will help resolve uh, immediate needs for Iraqis in Baghdad and beyond. We did our third audit of the CERT program in this last quarter and found that it continues to improve. There, there are still some documentation issues that need to be addressed, but for the most part, this is a program that based on our reviews is generally working. The, the issues we uncovered, the multinational core Iraq has agreed to, to address, and, and, that, and they're already addressing them, which is, which is, as you know, Mr. Chair, my underlying philosophy is to ensure that the findings that we make are addressed before our audits uh, uh, reach the, uh, publication. Uh, given the current phase of, of Iraq's recovery, uh, as I said, the Iraq government must shoulder the burden of financing its recovery, and, and that means that, that the Ministry of Electricity has to spend more than the third of its capital budget that it spent last year, and, and, the ministry, and water has to spend more than just under half of their budget they spent last year. You also asked for recommendations from me about uh, how funding might be targeted moving forward. This is a policy question best directed to the responsible agency, specifically Department of State. Uh, but, but continuing to support these programs, as I've identified, the PRT and the SERP, as well as ministry capacity development uh, are essential. Um, and and Sig SIGR's work to date has identified uh, many issues and made numerous recommendations. The agencies have been responsive generally. Uh, but, but we need to continue to follow up on our recommendations, which we're doing, and, uh, and continue to push for improved project o oversight in, in Iraq. Uh, we continue to monitor Iraq's anti-corruption efforts, and frankly, I was very concerned based on my visits this trip with, at, at, with the Commission on Public Integrity. And the reality is, is that, um, that he, he has lost much of his enforcement power uh, because of, uh, through, through, through political uh, means. He cannot prosecute, uh, as he told me just last week, ministers or former ministers by direction of the Prime Minister's office. The legislation that, 
that, that, is, that was created, to, designed to create and empower the CPI has been pulled back from the Council of Representatives and, and is being revised in the Prime Minister's Office, which endangers in independence. And finally, there's a provision in the Iraqi Criminal Code, Article 134B, that permits any minister by fiat to exempt any employee from prosecution. So there's a bulwark uh, essentially uh, uh, existing uh, wi within the, the, the political system that, that fundamentally undermines the capacity of the Commission on Public Integrity, which is their FBI, to enforce and fight corruption. And as we've reported, Mr. Chairman, I know over and over again, corruption is, a, is, a, is the second insurgency, I've called it in Iraq. It's, it undermines uh, much progress that, that we're trying to achieve and, and uh, continues to be a, a frustration. We continue to push a wide range of audits forward. We, we are moving into focused financial reviews. Uh, we will have an audit of Bechtel, the Bechtel contract. We're also auditing DynCorp and Blackwater and Parsons over, over the next quarter. Um, we're comparing uh, uh, how the Gulf Region Division of Corps of Engineers is doing versus the Air Force Center for Environmental Excellence, the two key uh, contracting entities uh, in Iraq. We're, we're, we're going to have a review in the next quarter of the support to the anti-corruption effort in, in Iraq. We're, we're looking at, um, at a comparison of design-build contracting versus direct contracting, another lesson learned uh, from, from the Iraq experience. And, and we're doing, as I said, assessments of the PRT program, and we'll continue to look at the CERP program. Our CERP review, though, will move from an audit perspective to an inspection perspective. Uh, not this quarter, but the following quarter, I've directed my inspection staff to go look at only CERP projects. So we, you get some input about how those projects have done. This next quarter, from inspections, you'll, you'll get eight more reports about sustainment. So it will, it will uh, flesh out a, a little bit more uh, uh, that issue. As, most notably, we're, we're visiting the Aldura uh, power plant, which has been the subject of some concern, I know, of this committee. Our, our investigations team continues to make progress. I met, with, I met with every member of my staff when I was over there, all the auditors, inspectors, and investigators, and I have to tell you, I can't go into detail with respect to the investigations, but I'm very impressed with the progress that, that we are making in a, in a very coordinated interagency effort that is, that is yielding fruit that will uh, become evident over time. Um, as, I, as I've been talking about our lessons learned report, I think are perhaps the most important component of our work in the long run because it, it, it helps address the challenges that have burdened the, the program and how the Congress and the agencies can address them and improve the government systems so that we are better postured to engage in post-conflict contingency relief and reconstruction management. Finally, Mr. Chairman, in preparation for our move into the new embassy compound in the fall, we are reducing our personnel footprint in Baghdad from 55 to 30 staff. Uh, I remain proud of all my staff who, who, are, who are operating, as I said, in a palpably dangerous environment in Baghdad, uh, carrying out the important mission that you've assigned to us uh, with integrity, dedication, and courage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowen. Before I get to my questions, I was watching your lovely mother, and her face reflects the same pride that my wife's face reflects when our youngest granddaughter wins another tennis match. <laughs> Thank you. Let me join you, Mr. Bowen, uh, in paying tribute to all of our troops and to all of your people who are undertaking such an incredibly dangerous mission. Um, in this connection, uh, may I begin the questioning by asking you to comment on this past weekend's New York Times story, which says that um, so far, 917 private contractors have lost their lives. Over 12,000 were wounded in battle or injured on the job. And um, I am wondering if you can comment on the extent to which these private contractors, 12,000 wounded, 
almost 1,000 killed, uh, could be given more security as they undertake their difficult mission. Well, there's no doubt that uh, the dangerous environment uh, that pervades Baghdad exposes everyone there to, uh, to uh, lethal, lethal uh, attack. And, and that includes the contractors, and that includes uh, journalists as well. We report on this in our, uh, in our quarterly right at the front because I think that's an important fact to get out. Nine journalists were killed this, this last quarter, and over 100 have been killed in the last four years. The, the, uh, the challenge in Iraq, as I said, is this is not the Marshall Plan. This is a reconstruction program carried out under fire. And the lessons learned from that, lesson learned from that, as I, as I alluded to in my statement, is stabilization is an essential prerequisite to an effective relief and reconstruction program. Uh, to, to conduct a, a conflict and a reconstruction program simultaneously yields uh, the tragic results that you alluded to in, in the contracting community and also, as I just mentioned, in, the, in the, those who are covering and reporting on the on what's going on over there. You ask how can it be improved, that, that, that's, a, uh, that, that's a process that, that's an everyday occurrence in Iraq. Uh, there are systems that I can't talk about, but, but that coordinate uh, data and intelligence and distribute it uh, to, so that contractors understand the threat that day. Uh, enhancing uh, that system or preparing it more effectively in, in advance uh, might uh, be one way to, uh, br to reduce that death toll. <clears throat> Ms. Bowen, earlier this month, an international compact for Iraq was endorsed by some 60 countries, the European Union, and the United Nations. What do you expect as a result of this compact? The compact is especially important because its appendix carries with it a series of benchmarks. Benchmarks are uh, a, a significant current topic, obviously, with respect to aid to Iraq. And I think that uh, it, it's worthwhile to, to uh, review those benchmarks, and specifically, uh, some of them include uh, requirements of, of improving the security environment, the, the, actually the operational capacity of the Iraqi security forces, passing the hydrocarbon law, moving forward on political reconciliation reforms and, and economic initiatives. Uh, so I think that, that uh, first and foremost, uh, the, the compact is useful as a further guide to, uh, to, to providing uh, funding to Iraq. Uh, I think it's also critical because it brings the Gulf states into the, the, the uh, mix. Uh, that is, uh, they, they now, through the compact, uh, will, will have a more focused and well-defined uh, role to play in, in, in trying to achieve progress economically in Iraq. Uh, Ms. Bowen, um, in October 2004, there was a donors conference in Madrid. At that conference, apart from U.S. contributions, $13.5 billion was pledged by various countries to participate in the reconstruction of Iraq. How much of that money has been delivered, put to good use? And I very much hope you are able publicly to identify the countries which have not kept their pledges. Well, we have a detailed uh, report upon that, on that in our quarterly, and so I would, I would uh, I would refer you to that because it's a, it's a long list, but the 14 billion, roughly, that was pledged uh, at Madrid, about three and a half billion has been forthcoming. But also, I have to point out that the data on that uh, is difficult to, to acquire at this point because of the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's within the uh, sovereignty of the government of Iraq now to manage those uh, bilateral and multilateral loan relationships. But the government of Iraq makes the figures available to you. Uh, in a very uh, limited in a way. We get them through the, the mission, and, and it's difficult. This is, this is the challenge of obtaining data on any front uh, in Iraq. 
uh, and, and, and it afflicts this particular issue as well. Well, which of the major donors have failed to fulfill their obligations? Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would, I would, uh, would rather... Uh, no, I want you to name them publicly now. Well, I was, let, let me name the ones who have come forward. Japan and the United Kingdom are the two that have, have most uh, effectively supported. They, they comprise virtually all of the $3.5 billion that, that I just alluded to. Uh, other than, than those two, uh, based on the data we have, there's been limited uh, forthcoming. There, 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 has, there have been contributions to the, the World Bank IRFI uh, fund, which, which is being managed. Uh, by a number of nations, but again, I, I, I would I would be happy to give you a follow-up. Uh, no, I, I want well. you to talk about it now. Which country has made major commitments at the October 2004 meeting and has not fulfilled them? Uh, well, again, again, the, the one, the only ones that really have fulfilled them are. I understand the, the ones who have fulfilled Japan. them. Which ones? Take a look. I'll give you all the okay. time you need. Right. We are not afraid to embarrass countries which make commitments at a public donors conference and fail to fulfill them. Okay. Just go down the list, Mr. Bowen. Well, the European Commission uh, needs to ha made made substantial uh, what promises. What was the commitment of the European Union? It, it has committed uh, approximately 779 million. And how much of that, to the best of your knowledge, has been delivered? Uh, uh, well. We, we don't have a percentage for it, but they have fallen short. I, I, Mr. Chairman, I'm, just, I'm happy to give you a detailed uh, No, response. I will not take okay. your answer later. Okay. I will take it now. Okay. Okay, uh, the, the, the European Commission comprised 33% of, uh, of the amount pledged. How to, much to is that? 33% uh, that, that, that the European Commission pledged. What, what is that in dollar figures, approximately? Uh, that, that would amount to approximately uh, uh, of the total e European Commission amount, uh, approximately four billion. Four billion. That's right. And how much of that was delivered? Uh, a, 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 a small percentage of it was delivered. Okay. Less than ten percent. Uh, I, I will I, I've actually delivered on the ground in Iraq. Yes, I, I would say in that region. So ninety percent of what the European Commission has pledged in October 2004 has not been delivered? Uh, that, that, that's my estimate. That's I'll, your I'll estimate. I accept it as an estimate. How about Saudi Arabia? Uh, How so much did so the Saudi Saudis Arabia, pledge? I know, has, has, has not uh, come forward. How much did they pledge? Let's see if I have that in here. Mr. Chairman. Saudi Arabia, yes. Yes. Saudi um, Arabia. 
Mr. Bowen and Mr. Fi Chairman. Fi 500 million. I know million. that Ambassador Robin Raphael is, is behind uh, the Inspector General. I'm wondering if uh, I'm delighted if to have her has, assist. Uh, 500 million was pledged has, by Saudi. Saudi Arabia yes. pledged 500 million. That's right. How much of that was delivered? Uh, we, we do not have a figure f reported on delivery, but very little. I know, I know uh, from other reporting. Would you say probably also less than 10 percent, if any? Th that would be my rough estimate. How about Kuwait? <coughs> Kuwait uh, did not have a pledge in the, now excuse me, 500 million. How much of that was delivered? Uh, Again, we, we don't have the, the, the final figures on that, but a, but a relatively small portion of it. Would again. you say probably less than 10 percent? That's, that's my rough estimate, yes. How about the United Arab Emirates? 215 million. And how much of that was delivered? It's the same answer. Less than 10 percent. That, that's my r estimate, but I will give you, I will have to research it. Again, the, the, uh, the access to the data since last fall has been very limited because that's now within the Iraq government's sovereignty. Well, let me just say this is a disgraceful performance and I am, I am appalled by it. I also would like to ask you, Ms. Bowen, to comment, and I realize this is speculative in nature, on Chairman uh, OB and my proposal four years ago that half of our aid should be given in the form of a loan which would make the Iraqis feel more invested in the reconstruction projects because it would be half their money which eventually they would have to repay. Do you agree in retrospect that it would have been wiser to have half of our reconstruction money take the form of a loan, la rather than have all of it be given as a grant. I agree that conditionality should, should be a part of, of foreign aid packages. And, and, that, and the, one, the one thing that has really worked in Iraq over the last two years is the IMF standby agreement, wherein a certain amount of money was, was offered in loans and grants to Iraq if they met certain benchmarks, like fuel subsidy reform. Uh, before the standby agreement was, was initiated, it was six cents a gallon in, in Iraq. That, that is now up to over 30 cents. Progress has been made, and as a result, debt relief uh, occurred. So conditionality can work in Iraq. The IMF standby agreement is the example of that. Uh, th so so uh, in practice and in theory, uh, conditionality of the kind you are describing, uh, I think, is an essential element to, to uh, this kind of foreign aid package. Now, the final question I want to raise, Mr. Bowen, you are free not to answer, but I hope you will. As you know, I have been highly laudatory of your performance yes. during the, your entire tenure, publicly and privately. And I feel very strongly that you are among the most effective public servants appointed by this administration. Lately, you have come under some attack by some members of your staff. I have no knowledge, positively or negatively, of the accuracy of those attacks. Mm -hmm. But I would not be surprised to find that you have come under attack because you are performing your job without political favor and without partisanship as a public servant. Would you care to comment on the attacks on you personally in recent weeks? Well, Mr. Chairman, I will only say that this is an administrative investigation that arose as a result of a complaint filed 17 months ago by disgruntled former employees. Uh, it's virtually over, and, uh, and I'm not, I don't have any concerns about it. Well, let me say to you, without knowing any of the facts, that speaking for myself, you have the full confidence of the chairman of this committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. ross -Leitinen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your um, excellent uh, questions. I think that Americans, I, in my district for sure, and I'm not going to speak for other, other districts, we're, we're hungry for success. We want 
We want to uh, be successful, be victorious in our fight against uh, uh, Islamic extremists that do want to destroy our, our way of life. And, and when we read about the waste, the fraud, the abuse that is going on in the Iraqi reconstruction efforts, it, their hopes are dimmed because they, they don't want their tax dollars to be going to um, lining the, the pockets of, of uh, greedy contractors who are not doing their job in helping the Iraqi people secure basic services like water and electricity and the basic uh, uh, stuff of life. And they want us to be successful. So I, I congratulate you for the work that you're doing because someone like you whose job is to look for problems. Mm -hmm. Your job is to say, let's. how can we improve this? How can we make this work? How can we help the Iraqis right. build a better society? And and it it's good for our constituents to know that we're out there, not Pollyanna, looking at, oh, everything is great. We're looking for problems, and we're looking for solutions to those problems. Mm -hmm. So your role is an important one because we want to win, and we want to have faith that our tax dollars are being wisely used. So the more that you do, the more reports that you issue, I think the more comforted we are that, uh, that those lessons are learned and that those mistakes are, are not going to be repeated. And I think some of the statements that you made are, are so true when you say this is not a Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. This is a reconstruction effort under fire. That's right. As the IEDs are, are going off, uh, we're trying to get electrical plants going and, and uh, water generators going and, and electricity flowing uh, and uh, we're doing adequate, subadequate, or pretty bad. But I don't think people would say that we're doing a very good job yet of reconstruction. It's very difficult, as you say, to do this uh, under fire every day. And another statement that you made that I think is uh, is very interesting and, and very telling about uh, the nature of the problem is that you say that corruption is the second insurgency. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about uh, the issue of, of corruption. Um, you talked about in your testimony weakened capacity, the politici uh, politicizing the uh, anti-corruption entities in Iraq. Are we moving in the in the in a more positive direction, or are we going backward? You had mentioned that in in the structure, there is the equivalent of their FBI, of our FBI over there, right. and it has a clause saying that they can exempt anyone from uh, these uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, uh, programs. Are, do you feel that we're moving in, in a positive way to root out this uh, systemic corruption that's been ingrained in, uh, in this despotic regime for, for so long. And secondly, in, uh, in your lessons learned reports, we've had three reports, um, have any of the recommendations from the, the first report still appear on the second and the third so that we, we haven't rooted out the problem? We've identified the problem, but we haven't been successful in eliminating that problem. Are the uh, is the third report substantially different in the terms of the problems you've identified, meaning they've become more, um, more of a problem of governance, uh, or is it still the, the problems of, uh, uh, of the programs that, that we've got going over there and making sure that our tax dollars are, are being spent in, in the best way possible? And I'll leave you to answer. Thank you, Mr. Sure. Nolan. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Rush Lightning. The, as to, as to your second question, there is a recommendation from our earlier lessons learned report that again appears in our most recent one, and that is the need to authorize and fund SCRS, the, uh, the entity within the State Department created by NSPD 44, whose job it is to plan and coordinate among uh, departments for post-conflict contingency relief and reconstruction operations. Uh, so, uh, and I know there was legislation pending to do that, and so we our our re latest recommendation simply uh, in, in affirms the importance of that legislation. 
Uh, but our, our less deserved reports are ob obviously address three different areas, human capital mm -hmm. management, contracting, and program and project management. So the recommendations other than that particular one diverge among, among those reports. Uh, as to corruption, there, there, there is some good news to report on how, I think, um, how the Iraqi government is beginning to address it, and that is the Joint Anti-Corruption Council was officially formed uh, this this week, uh, the the uh, order was signed, and it 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 brings uh, together the anti-corruption entities within the prime minister's office. So there's some uh, there's some uh, question about how it's going to operate, but but the the inspectors general, there's 29 of them, created by the CPA, uh, a mixed a, gr a mixed bag. I mean, there's mixed success within those those offices. The Commission on Public Integrity, I've already talked about, and the Board of Supreme Audit, which is the analog in Iraq to the Government Accountability Office and has been around for many decades. Uh, and so it has a, a more robust infrastructure. And, and Dr. Abdel Basit, who's the president of Board Supreme Audit, I meet with regularly. And, I, and I, I, he's one of the people I found I can trust over there. And, I, and he's, he's sincerely trying to push forward a, an audit program. He wants investigative powers as well. So there is overlap among those three entities. And, and I think the Joint Anti-Corruption Council is trying to resolve some of that overlap. Uh, but uh, th there's no doubt that the legal bulwark that prevents prosecution of corruption that I described earlier uh, is, is simply an incentive to, to commit corruption. Absolutely. And, and, uh, and, and I don't think that, that you can really advance in that area without good, without prosecution, successful prosecutions, because that's what serves so as the deterrent. And Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, I realize that the three reports deal with, with different aspects of it. I was just wondering if there's a common theme yes. that you see that, uh, that is in, in all three reports. But I wanted to ask you about the uh, Goldwater-Nichols uh, reform that uh, you put forth in, in, in this report to integrate uh, the agencies like USAID, Department of Defense, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, if you could uh, just briefly elaborate on that. Well, I, I think there, there are a number of things that can be achieved through that kind of reform. One, and there, there's another thread that, that goes through each report, and that is staffing, human capital management. Uh, there was a problem, for instance, in the contracting area of not having overlap among contracting officers. One, one a contract officer would leave, a contract would go unintended for, and then the next one would, would arrive later, and it's simply a, a lack of coordination of staffing, and that led to uh, neglect of oversight on, on, on some contracts. Uh, the the uh, beyond Goldwater Nichols idea is simply to to begin a process uh, based on what we've learned in Iraq to promote better integration among those departments whose mission is to protect U.S. interest overseas DOD DOS and uh, USAID and and the as our lessons learned reports spell out the the uh, the planning uh, phase pre-war and 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 uh, and subsequent thereto was somewhat balkanized. Uh, there was a lack of effective coordination. There was a difficulty in getting agencies to get people over to Iraq to, uh, to participate. Uh, that all of those problems, that, that kind of problem can be remedied uh, through, through better cross-pollination, if you will, through better integration, through training. Uh, and, and my uh, underlying proposal is to form a commission that would make recommendations to the Congress about how that could be done, and that, that commission should be comprised of persons with expertise in the area. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank your you. service, Mr. Thank Bowen. You. Thank you very much. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Watson. Mr. Bowen, um, the, is it uh, Naina Vec Plain? I'm sorry. Uh, Nainina Vec plane, the planes N in N Iraq. Anyway. Uh, N no, Nineveh. N Nineveh? N Nineveh. Okay. Nineveh. Thank you for the pronunciation. And the surrounding areas are the historic homelands of the Christian Assyrians. That's right. Yeah. And as such, this area is the largest attraction point for Christians. And this is where people would come and uh, to see this attraction, to be in that area and expend um, monies and so on. 
It's my understanding that since the late uh, 2005, no notable reconstruction or redevelopment project has been undertaken in these plains. And uh, it has been ignored, probably developmentally, in a manner that can only be compared to apartheid like D development of an ethnic community. And as a result, no aid reaching this area and relative to other areas. And these uh, IDPs are choosing to flee the country entirely. So the Christians, they're de-Christianizing this area in Iraq. Uh, I think it's a concern that we ought to look at, not only because of the injustices being done to the minority groups in Iraq, but because if there is any hope that Iraq is going to function as a multi-ethnic democracy, the government must protect all Iraqis, not just the Sunnis, the Shias, the Kurds, et cetera. So my question is, uh, have you had, or your department, had a mandate to ensure that United States funds in Iraq are being used strategically, but also in an equitable way. Is there not an understanding on the part of our leaders in Iraq that when clear-cut discrimination by the United States takes place, it undermines our efforts to create a multi-ethnic Iraq that includes our Iraqis, the Arabs, the Kurds, uh, the Syrians, uh, the Turks, and others as well. And is there any thought about our policies that are pushing Christians uh, and other minorities out of Iraq, where they have lived for centuries? So my concern is, what are we doing for these small ethnic units that are not, I know you spend a lot of time in Baghdad and mm -hmm. the near surroundings, but what are we doing to be sure that we use our funds as we go through reconstruction to assure that all various ethnic groups can enjoy the benefits of this new democracy? Well, it's funny you should ask. Uh, yesterday I had a phone call from a representative of the Assyrian Christians, Ken Joseph, here, in, uh, and, and he, he actually was optimistic about progress he was making in talks with Prime Minister Maliki about creating uh, Nineveh province. Uh, as to uh, the other issues you raise with respect to, to, uh, to how they are treated, that, that, that's a question for a policy question about the Department of State. But with respect to the reconstruction component, I, I need to get back to you. I, I don't think it's correct that no projects have been performed in Nineveh. I, well, uh, if so you I, could I, will, I will give you a breakdown of how many projects have been done uh, up there, because I did review that with the Commander of the Corps of Engineers. Yeah, we are aware that people are moving over the border lines of Iraq into other areas. That's right. And we're losing a lot of our Christians, the Syrians. That's right. So if you could report back to us as you, I see your thick uh, binder there, mm -hmm. uh, and I know you can't cover everything, but this is an area that I would be particularly interested Good. in. And if you could provide us information, because I want to be sure that we don't reinforce discrimination, only focus on those three major tribes. Right. Uh, if we want to build a true democracy, we have to be sure of equitable I'll get support. you a list of projects okay. that have been conducted in, 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 in that Nineveh. Area. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate Thank you. it. Gentleman from California, Mr. Roderbacher. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me again express my appreciation to, to you for your leadership. Um, uh, during this entire session, and uh, this again exemplifies the type of uh, responsible leadership you're providing this committee. Uh, we need to learn the lessons of uh, Iraq, just like we needed to learn the lessons of Vietnam and uh, the lessons of every conflict that we've been in. And let me just note that uh, we have had such problems in every conflict that I have studied. Uh, George Washington's army was, it was impossible for them to get their supplies at Valley Forge due to incompetence and corruption and uh, an inability of our government, our fledgling government of our founding fathers. 
uh, to do their job. That didn't mean it was uh, justified or excused, but that's what the reality was. That didn't take away from the nobility of the American Revolution. Uh, meat, tainted meat, was sold to the military during the Spanish-American War, killed more of our troops than did the Spanish. Didn't mean that uh, the liberation of Cuba was not something that was a, we, we should have done and should have been involved in. Ileana can certainly testify to that. <laughs> Ileana says, let's do it again. Uh, the fact is, during World War II, uh, our Sherman tanks, when they came ashore at Normandy, uh, were facing German tanks that were superior technologically, and many Americans lost their lives due to that incompetence mm -hmm. on the part of long-range planners. It did not take away from the nobility of America's effort to liberate uh, the, uh, the mainland of Europe from the Nazis, uh, and Mr. Lantos can stand his testimony to that. The fact is that uh, we must do these things and make uh, and try to meet the challenges of corruption in every conflict. I appreciate that you are in the front lines, you yourself, are in the front lines of that effort. And uh, again, Mr. Lantos's uh, accolades to you is to speak for the whole committee here and our trust you. for you. And your mother has every reason to be proud of the great job you're doing for America. We're proud of you too. Now, with that said, uh, the lessons that we uh, have, you know that we need to do, uh, uh, they're not just military lessons, not just political lessons, but the economic lessons that you're talking about right now uh, uh, need to be put to, to, to good use. You mentioned a civilian reserve corps as a possible yes. idea that in the future we might be able to put together that would help us move forward with rebuilding projects under fire That's right. that, that uh, when we meet these challenges. You might go into that idea a little bit, and that might be something uh, under Mr. Lantos's leadership we could work together on. What, what was that uh, well, did, you, did you have in mind? Uh, it, it was uh, initially envisioned in NSPD, National Security Presidential Directive 44, that created SCRS. And, and it's certainly a, one of the missions of SCRS is to develop that. It, it's, it's been burdened by not having auth authorization or appropriation to, to carry this forward. I think their funding last year was $2 million, and, and they operate almost exclusively with detailees. Uh, and so progress on this front has been limited to date. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the concept of, of having a cadre trained uh, shell organization, if you will, ready uh, to, to, to manage post-conflict uh, contingency operations, and then uh, a network of individuals who have a different day job, but who are who are ready to step forward, at, you know, when as the our, country as calls, our as our reserves makes are, sense. As our reserves are in the military, exactly as well. right. It sounds it sounds like a good idea to me, and uh, I'd be happy to work with you on that project, and maybe we can uh, make that real, so that when we get ourselves in a situation in the future, we'll have uh, have something else to draw upon to meet the challenge. Uh, let me just note that uh, Mr. Lantos talked about. Uh, the decision early on uh, to base our rebuilding efforts on grants rather than loans. Uh, I remember I was one of the few Republicans, I'm sorry to say, that voted for that particular position, realizing that the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the wisdom of, uh, of making sure that the Iraqi people, through their future oil revenues, would actually have to pay for some of the efforts that made to rebuild our country. Uh, under the president's uh, uh, guidance and leadership, unfortunately, the Republicans made the wrong decision. And I believe that was decision was made, the White House made that decision in order to protect German and French banks who were afraid that their loans to Saddam Hussein's Iraq uh, would not be honored. I think that's a disgrace, and uh, this administration needs to be held accountable uh, for that uh, decision at that time. Uh, and uh, again, and Mr. Lantos has also indicated that our allies have not stepped forward. And although he put you on the spot, I think he, we needed to do that. Mm -hmm. American people need to pay attention to those mistakes and make sure we don't make them again. And I appreciate you enlightening us today. Uh, thank you thank very you. much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so you found our weak spot and brought your mother. <laughs> you've, complete, you've completely defanged the attack dogs on, on our side. 
And I, I know that the only reason that you were reluctant to out those people who didn't meet their commitments is because your mother once told you if you have nothing nice to say about somebody, don't say <laughs> anything. Well, uh, so I brought this car into the, into the shop, see? And I says to the guy, I says, uh, I just need five things done. I need the air and the tires. I need you to fill a tank. I need you to wash the, uh, the windshield. Um, and uh, I need a new engine. <laughs> he says, it'll be $5,000. It'll take two weeks. I go, give him $5,000. I'll come back two weeks later. I say, how are we doing? He says, ready to send through. Uh, I, I think that's I think that's what the math seems to be indicating that you're that you're that you're saying. Um, your 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 summary answer at the beginning was 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 yes we are successful and but when you when you when you take a look at it you know we did the windshield and we we filled the tank we checked the tires and all that stuff but the big projects we haven't done uh, that we've that we've that we have met our targets or our goals or have been successful in 70 percent of the of the projects those are the real small things but if if 95 percent of the economy of the entire country is based on petroleum and we have failed there i think the target was something like three million barrels a day and we're doing 1.6 1 1.6 1 .6, i'd mm -hmm. give it a 52 percent which is not you know, it's half, but it's not a passing grade. Uh, so if in, in, the, in the, big, the big ticket item of, of, of the engine, uh, we're making no progress or negative progress, uh, I, don't, I don't think the overall score can be that we're, we're being successful, and maybe you could respond to that. Well, clearly, as I, as I said in my answer, this, the story of Iraq reconstruction is a mixed one. There are A lot has been achieved with the $21 billion in the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, but we've spent uh, the better part of this hearing talking about the challenges that have confronted the overall program, beginning with, beginning with security, which meant that virtually every project ended up costing more and taking longer than it did, and that meant as we've pointed out in our previous reports, a reconstruction gap evolved, which means that we achieved less than we intended to because of the higher costs. Uh, the challenges of weak planning, for, particularly for sustainment, which, which we have talked about in our quarterly reports. I, I, think, I think the point is if we're not successful in the petroleum sector, we're not successful. Is, is that fair? Well, well I, you make an excellent point, and that is the economic engine that drives Iraq is the petroleum sector. There, there were assumptions uh, early on, and the IRF allocations reflect that assumption, that the petroleum sector would begin to provide a lot of funding for the recovery of Iraq rapidly. Uh, that uh, did not happen as planned. Nine percent of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund was invested in the petroleum sector, as opposed to 34 percent in security, 23 percent in, uh, in electricity, 12 percent in water, and 12 percent in, uh, in transportation, nine percent in oil and gas. And, and, uh, and so that, that raises the question, uh, why not a greater emphasis on the engine? And, uh, and that, that is why the Ministry of Oil must execute its capital budget because that engine is still not working. And, and for Iraq, I think, to, to move forward economically, uh, that sector must improve. Let, let, let me say, and I think this should have been said at, at the outset, that any, any failure in Iraq is, is not your failure or the failure of, of your people and, and your staff. Uh, it's the failure of the policy. You're there, you're there for us to grade it. You're there to tell us it's working, it's not working. Um, and, you know, it's like I tell a guy, is, 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 my, is my signal light working? He goes back there and he says, it's working, it's not working, it's working, it's not working, it's working. You know, it depends on when you're looking at it uh, and what you're looking at to, to, to see if it's working or it's not. And if, you, if we're looking at the 70 percent that makes up 5 percent, then that's working. It's really not working. Um, so I, 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 I guess it depends on, you know, what we're looking at and, and, and what we're grading. Um, but but I, I, I think it's important not to look at this, you know, 
like, like the, the teachers who philosophically believe in social promotion, which is a big mm -hmm. issue in the field of education. You know, the kid is 23 years old and he's in the fourth grade. Do you promote him or do you leave him back again? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the answer a lot of teachers doesn't pay to leave him back. Let's just give him a passing grade and move him on. Uh, to say that the system is working when it really isn't, by, by any real measurement standard as to what's important to move it forward, uh, I, I think is not helpful. Uh, if, if nothing's working, maybe the people who say we should be getting out of there and, and seeing if they can fend for themselves and take their own responsibility, uh, you know, have, a, have an argument there. Uh, that's not the purpose of, of today's hearing, but today's, as I understand it, is to figure out whether it's working or not. You can respond if you like, otherwise we'll move on. Well, well I, I think you're alluding to our inspections regime, which, in, which we visited 94 sites all over Iraq. About 70% of those uh, are operational. Uh, and and as it, it fits within the, the larger point I made, which is $21 billion uh, accomplished a lot. Now, admittedly, some of it, as, as our first look uh, this last quarter reveals, are not op working as well as as they should be. And second, uh, because of the increased cost, 34 percent of the IRF spent on security, uh, much higher. There were four reprogrammings that moved lots of money out of bricks and mortar into security, uh, meant that the infrastructure didn't get the level of attention that was expected. I mean, that's a, that's a shortfall, that's a failure of sorts, and that, that uh, the, the start that, that the United States intended to provide Iraq on its recovery was not as robust as uh, initially planned because of the security situation primarily. Last question for me, uh, and I guess it's my I used to be a teacher day. Uh, <laughs> under, under, the, under the No Child Left Behind Act, um, if, 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 uh, if schools are non-performing and, and the kids aren't learning any better based on testing measurements, the administration's point of view is you take the money away. Um, why don't why don't why we, we reduce the funding for those school districts that that aren't meeting the aren't meeting the standards? Why why do we not apply that here, or should we? Well 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 as I said the uh, the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund is largely spent, and uh, and we're the the uh, the the posture of the United States in supporting Iraq economically has changed to targeted aid rather than a, a large-scale reconstruction program. And that targeted aid uh, in the ESF is, is, is uh, substantially going to the, to the PRT programs and, and also to USAID's local governance programs across the country. And, in, and uh, on, on the DOD side, of, uh, is going to, to SERP. And, and I think that those are two places where that money is going because they have, uh, they have worked reasonably well. Uh, over and, and fit the current climate, frankly, uh, uh, which I wouldn't, which is no longer reconstruction, capital R. It's a, it's a relief and development program. Maybe if we have time, we'll come back to that. Mr. Bilirakis. Mr. Chairman, if I could just uh, Abs absolutely. put in my two cents worth, also as a former educator, no child left behind. It in no way takes away funds from uh, low uh, performing districts. In fact, the uh, the impetus, the rationale behind No Child Left Behind is to uh, further uh, provide incentives for those areas that aren't, uh, those schools that aren't performing well and, uh, and make sure that uh, we do away with what the President calls the, uh, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Mm -hmm. Well, that was, that was a different President that used all those fancy words, actually. <laughs> but uh, none, <laughs> none, none of the uh, Nonetheless, we could, we could uh, argue that, but I think if you spoke to some of your school districts, they would tell you what the problems there are. But that, that's for a committee down the hall. <laughs> Mr. Bilirakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for testifying before us, Mr. Bohm, today. And I'd also like to express my dismay uh, uh, for our allies not uh, fulfilling their commitment. I'm very disappointed in that. My first question is, is disturbing that the Iraq construction projects resulting in the misuse of billions of dollars that should have been used to restore Iraq's economy and civil society. The key to making government effective, of course, is holding it accountable. You told the Senate Judiciary Committee in March that it's difficult to find evidence, such as documents or eyewitnesses, 
that are needed to prosecute cases of waste or mismanagement. The Iraq Commission on Public Integrity has estimated that there were $5 billion that was lost uh, annually due to corruption. It particularly notes that Iraqi government officials are hampering efforts to curb corruption under a 1971 law that was reinstated by the, uh, the Prime Minister, Maliki. He also ordered the Commission not to refer cases to an investigative court involving ministers or former ministers without his consent. It has been reported that more than 48 investigations have been stopped under this law. The Iraqi government is clearly misguided in some of its priorities. The bottom line, however, is that these are our taxpayers' dollars, and they're not always used uh, effectively. What can be done by Congress, in your view, to help you increase the prosecution of those who wasted or mismanaged these funds? Well, as I said in my opening statement, we are making a lot of progress on a number of significant cases. Uh, the investigative process takes takes time, as I've learned, and uh, but we have 28 of our 78 cases right now at the Department of Justice under prosecution, and 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 I, my discussions with my investigators make me optimistic that over the course of this year, we will see. Uh, uh, real results from those prosecutions. Uh, I, th I do think that uh, uh, strengthening the fraud fighting effort uh, uh, in Iraq would be helpful, and, and a lot of that work can be done now here in, in uh, the United States as well in, in trying to track uh, uh, the, the corruption trail. But, but finally, let me say that, that I think partly because of the forward-leaning deterrent presence that, that SIGR has exerted over the last three years and, and has eventually teamed and partnered with Army's Criminal Investigator Division and, and the FBI over the last two years, uh, that, that deterrence has, has uh, been effective. Uh, we have not found that fraud within the U.S. program has been a significant component. By distinction, as you alluded to, corruption, fraud within the Iraqi system is rampant. And, and the, uh, the power of, of the uh, fraud fighting entities to, to push it back is weak. Thank you. What do you see happening in the next quarter for Iraqi construction, particularly with the implementation of the Baghdad security plan? Uh, I know you touched on it. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. We are going to look at projects that are being constructed as part of the Baghdad security plan. My inspectors have my charge over the next quarter to to, to begin uh, visiting those. Uh, there, there, there's no preliminary uh, information I have to report, though, on progress of reconstruction within that plan yet. But over in our next report, we should have some, some uh, information for you. But last question. When should we expect the 327,000 Iraqi troops to be fully functioning and efficiently protecting and securing major infrastructure, such as roads, electrical grids, and oil production? In well, your opinion, right? And as an a, estimation, a, as a as a uh, policy matter, that's a question for the Pentagon, of course. But we have looked at the use of the Iraq Security Forces Fund in, in several instances, specifically the weapons review that that we conducted uh, pursuant to Senator Warner's directive, and also our audit of logistic support, and found weaknesses in both areas. There, the uh, the weapons tracking system was was not proper, and that but that has been remedied. The logistical capacity of the Iraqi Ministry of Defense to support its forces in the field uh, remains uh, a challenge. Uh, I met with General Dempsey, who is the commander of Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq, uh, again this last trip, and uh, he's, he's, uh, he says there's been some progress, but, and, and they're, they're able to manage their own food and, and starting to manage their own fuel, which was, a, which was a, a big obstacle when we did our review last October. Uh, but uh, medical care and, and simply movement has been is continues to be a challenge. The other issue to address, of course, is staffing levels within those uh, units. And I know the general accounting, the government accountability office is is in the midst of a review on that front and is having some challenges in getting information on it. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wolsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being funny. You add. <laughs> 
something to our, our morning. Can't you thank me for being smart? Well, you're funny, I'm smart, actually. Thanks. <laughs> but we're all smart, but not very many of us are funny. Uh, you know, we do so much in Iraq that, from, as, from the United States that we are forcing upon the Iraqis. And thank you, Mr. Bowen, you've been great. You've stayed calm under pressure. This is not an easy thing for you to be doing. Um, and it just seems that um, I have to ask you, are there enough Iraqi people capable of doing these reconstruction jobs themselves? I mean, if, why aren't we letting them be the contractors for their own country? Well, you, you raised several issues there. I know. One, I have one, one is the issues one, in my well, no, they're head. good. They're good issues. The, the, <laughs> yeah. the first one is is the capacity of Iraqi subcontractors, which the United States is using uh, more often than not. Uh, the, the 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 reality is that design build contracts are cost plus contracts that result in subcontracting down some contracting in country, and most of the subcontractors are Iraqis, and that has proven, as our inspections and our audits show, to be a mixed bag. Uh, okay. Plumbing, plumbing has been a, is an issue. The Baghdad Security uh, uh, College, Police College, excuse me, Baghdad Police College is is the most notable example of of a lack of capacity to to carry out uh, basic construction. Uh, the 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 other issue you raise is is why aren't the Iraqis executing their own capital budgets, hiring their own contractors, c engaging in their own recovery? And the answer to that is they must uh, moving forward because the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund is spent. Uh, and uh, the United States is no longer doing reconstruction capital R. Uh, it's doing targeted aid. And, and that's why for Iraq to make progress, it must address the oil sector issue we talked about, and it must develop a plan that it implements effectively uh, nationwide to continue to restore its infrastructure. Do we have any uh, data that tells us if it's less safe for American contractors than, than the Iraqi contractors? Do they, hmm. uh, is there some sense of pride when it's built at home by locals versus uh, the U.S. stamp on it or an international stamp on it? Well, that is what I'm told, that for, for example, when an Iraqi subcontractor gets the award from an American contractor, they'll ask that Americans not visit the site because by visiting the site, it, it raises uh, the danger at the site. That should be a lesson to us, shouldn't it? Um, I don't, you don't need to, that's political, you don't have to answer that one. Um, do we have a separate process for monitoring and auditing how, what the Iraqis are doing with uh, international funding, mostly U.S. funding, but international funding versus what our own contractors, I mean, do we separate that? Do we know what Halliburton is doing versus what, uh, you know, uh, an Iraqi contractor is doing, or through their local governments? Well, our oversight is, my oversight is of uh, taxpayer dollars, the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund and FY2006 money appropriated for relief and reconstruction. So, so that is, that's all that I have information about, uh, you know, whether, whether there is uh, similar oversight of how the Iraqis themselves are, are, are spending their money and managing it, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't have any information on that. So, okay, I'm going to ask a question that's kind of a political answer, so you might not want to answer it, but in asking it, everybody will know what I think. Um, well, no, I'm not going to ask it yet, okay? <laughs> so, what do you, do you have, by the way, do you have, would you be able to tell us what you think we should be doing in the short term in Iraq or what we should be doing in the long term? Uh, on reconstruction, reconstruction. As I said, reconstruction capital R is, is concluded. Uh, there, there are still some large projects, especially in the electricity sector that the Gulf Region Division of the Corps of Engineers is managing. About $2 billion uh, left to spend, about $4 billion under management. So it's, it's, but relative to the overall investment, relatively small. The, the, the targets for the next phase of support uh, uh, to protect our interest in, in Iraq, uh, I think are, are apropos, are appropriate. And one, the provincial reconstruction team effort it is the most important national capacity to building, building program in Iraq, and it's about trying to get the provincial councils to manage their provinces. There's 18 provinces, 18 provincial councils. They, 
local, you know, politics is local, democracy is a local event, and th those councils are largely new. And the other thing that needs to happen, of course, is there needs to be a new provincial elections because the elections of 2005 were boycotted by the Sunnis, which created a, an imbalance in representation in a number of provinces, and new elections will fix that imbalance. Okay, I'm going to ask my question. Like uh, the Iraqis saying, U.S., stay away from our projects because we're, it's safer if you're not there. Would the international community weigh in if they didn't think there, it was all controlled by the United States? Would they weigh in uh, to a greater degree if uh, the Iraqis were controlling the budget, uh, their that, budgets? Uh, you know, I, I, that's, that's not an area I can really comment all on. Right, I appreciate uh, that. Thank and you. I, I think they would. Thank you. Mr. Poe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a few questions. I'm way over here on the end. Um, Good to see you, Judge. <laughs> every war has its war profiteers. I think it's always been that way. When the smoke clears, there's always suddenly new millionaires. And um, when the smoke clears on this war, um, who do you think the new millionaires are going to be? Well, it's a good question. I'll just give you a little anecdotal uh, insight from my uh, travels through Amman. The, the, the Jordanians are, are not happy uh, because of the number of Iraqis who've, who've emigrated, into, emigrated into Jordan with uh, large sums of money, which have caused the real estate prices in, in Amman to triple in the last year, according to, the, to my Jordanian friends. A couple other questions uh, on corruption and fraud, uh, <clears throat> where's the money going? I mean, I know it's lining the pockets of, uh, of some people who are just corrupt, but is any, are, is any of the money uh, being traced to our enemies, like Al-Qaeda? Uh, the the, the uh, belief of, uh, of the uh, Commission on Public Integrity is that, yes, some of that money is going there, but that's just the belief. We, uh, there's no... Uh, mechanism that I'm aware of or, uh, for tracking that. And, and if, if it is, if there is a mechanism out there, I'm sure it's highly classified. So if, if there is a belief, what would the percentage of that belief be? Yeah, he, he didn't offer up a, a, a guesstimate, but, uh, but it's, it's not implausible. One more question. Um, if you could compare uh, the American companies that are doing business in Iraq on reconstruction versus the Iraqi homegrown corruption. Could you put a percentage on, on that for me? Well, as I said, the, within the U.S. program, based on our work uh, over the last three years uh, that we've reported publicly, uh, there, there has not been a uh, significant fraud problem within the U.S. reconstruction program. As I said, we have 28 cases pending at the Department of Justice, and, and over time, uh, uh, that story will be told more fully. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Would, would the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, I, I would just like to ask Mr. Bowen just to um, further uh, one of his answers that was anecdotal about the Jordanian saying the price of real estate in Amman has tripled. Um, the, 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 the question I believe Mr. Poe asked uh, about who, are, who would the new millionaires be, I think, was trying to elicit uh, who's making money off of the deal. And the answer, um, I, I'm not sure how to interpret it. The, the real estate values in Amman are presumably going triple or much higher, not because of wealthy refugees coming and buying up, but because they're, all of these poor refugees are making huge demands uh, on the housing market, is that? Uh, he, he didn't spell out his complaint any further than what I just uh, recited, so I, I don't know the actual underlying economics there. See if you can get back to him. Okay. <laughs> when I, I'll be going back in August, so I'll, I'll see him again. Uh, Mr. Sears. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bowen. Well, you're like the wrong guy, the wrong person at the wrong place with the, all the, the, um, the cost of all the corruption that's, that is going on in Iraq. But you had said before that as much as 34 percent security costs overrun in some of these projects. No, what I said was 
34 percent of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund was spent on the security sector. And how much do you think is a percent of uh, corruption? Uh, well, it w as I said, within the U.S. program, corruption has been a very small component. Uh, within on the Iraqi side, uh, it, it has been a significant problem. Would you say it's 20 percent? No, I, I, I wouldn't. No, I'm trying to get at for every American dollar that we invest in this reconstruction of Iraq, how much does it go to corruption? How much does it go to uh, security? I mean, I, what, what do we get for a dollar? Uh, well, well uh, l l that's, a, that's a fair question. Uh, and, and it's one that- What do that I get for my it's, dollar? It's, Let me put it's, this way. it's one that, uh, that that my office is endeavoring to answer over the next year and a half, and we're doing it through focused financial audits of contractors and sectors. The, the Iraq Reconstruction Accountability Act of 2006, which extended my office's uh, jurisdiction to cover FY 2006 money, also asked that we conduct a forensic audit. A forensic audit, as I've learned, means lots of different things, but, it, but what it essentially uh, asks is, get down to the details of what happened to the taxpayer dollars invested in Iraq. And that's what you're asking. And that's, that's why we are, we are issuing our first focused financial audit of Bechtel in the next, next quarter. We have Parsons, Blackwater, DynCor, and, um, and other contractors and sectors on our, on our program of audits. And, uh, and at the end of this regime, uh, I expect to be able to give you a, a detailed answer. How much money is Iraq putting into uh, all this uh, reconstruction? The country of Iraq. Uh, yeah, that's the capital uh, budget execution problem that we've been talking about, <laughs> and n the answer is not enough. Uh, about a, qu a, a quarter of their capital budget was executed last year. The Ministry of Oil was the most egregious uh, uh, failure. Uh, three and a half billion in the capital budget and 50 million spent, 90 million spent, and that, uh, that simply is unacceptable. How much of that went to corruption? <laughs> uh, well, as Obviously I said, they got to feed the families. Judge, <laughs> the, the Commissioner on Public Integrity uh, uh, reports that he ent estimates 5 billion lost annually uh, to corruption in Iraq. Uh, you know, I, I listen to these things and I am like, I just c can't fathom that so much money gets lost and we don't get any, any bang for our money. I mean, I read an article the other day where we put up a street light and the next day is gone. Does that happen? Well, I don't know about that, but the security, that, that alludes to the security problem. Security impedes progress on every front, has made every project cost more and delayed every project. So why are we spending all this money in Iraq? I mean, what progress are we making when, when, well, when the I'll president says that we're making progress, Condoleezza Rice says we're making progress? Look, I know you're, you're in the hot seat, but I, I, I'm just, I think this is, when, when history gets done with this program, it's going to be the most wasteful program this country has ever gotten itself involved in. So, you know, what progress are we making if this is all happening? Well, as, as I said in my opening statement, and as our reports indicate, a lot has been built with the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, but the phase wherein the United States bears the burden of the reconstruction rock is past. Reconstruction capital R is over. Uh, targeted support is, is what characterizes the continuing foreign aid to Iraq. Uh, what can we make, what can we do to make Iraq participate in this program? There, there's a budget execution initiative that is uh, ongoing uh, in Iraq that has uh, benchmarks, if you will, uh, to, that, that is going to compel, we hope, the Iraqi ministries to execute their budgets. Indeed, there's a rule that has been implemented by the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Planning that requires every ministry to execute uh, at least half its annual budget by mid-year or to forfeit the balance. Can I ask you a personal question? Mm -hmm. How can you stay so calm <laughs> <laughs> when these people are ripping us off like they are? Uh, this <laughs> the is the American is, dollar. Well, I mean, is, I, yeah. I compliment you. You Thank are you. steady, you're calm. I am angry just thinking about this. 
that the American dollar is being wasted so much. How can you stay so calm? Well, yeah, I, <laughs> you're I, not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you take your mother out to lunch too. Thank Mr. De <laughs> Mr. Delahunt. <laughs> Are you going to the other side? I see my colleague uh, from Indiana, Mr. Burton. Um, Mr. Burton. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. I Chairman. always want to defer to Mr. Burton if I, if I have that I, opportunity. I've noticed this thing going on. Uh, I love you, man. I love you, too. <laughs> Regular order. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that troubles me, and I'm not sure you can answer this question, but the UAE, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, they haven't they haven't done much of anything right. and they, as i as i heard you answering questions a while ago the uh, saudis have pledged 500 million that's right uae had pledged 500 million that's right kuwait i don't think it pledged two, any but two, 250 250 and you said that they're all below 10 percent of their commitment that was my estimate. Mr. Oh. Uh, Chairman Lantos was pushing me on it, I, and I, I will get back to you with details on that. Well, so. even if it's 20%. Well, you're, you know, you're, but here, here, here's, here's my question. Is who, is, who, who is putting pressure on those countries that made a commitment and aren't living up to it? I mean, we're pouring our money into there and our life's blood into there, and we're protecting their fannies over there. And they're not living up to their commitment. I, I just well, like to know who's policing that. Well, Mr. Burton, you're exactly right because our commitment was the earth, and we've provided 100 percent of it, 21 billion, uh, as opposed to 500 million or 250 million. And that our Madrid commitment was the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, unconditional, a grant program. Uh, that, that does not characterize these other pledges from the Gulf states. The, the answer to your question is no one has been pushing them to hold accountable. Well, the, the, but I, there's a new process called the Compact for Iraq. I know you're aware of it. It just got approved finally after much delay at Sharm el Sheikh two weeks ago. And, and in that, those countries have transferred forward their Madrid pledges to, to uh, the Compact process. But again, as I mentioned earlier also, there's an appendix with benchmarks. So whether that money's coming forward from them will be dependent upon uh, certain events happening in Iraq. Well, I, I, I think uh, uh, Chairman Lantos and uh, uh, Mr. Ross Layton ought to ask uh, somebody okay. from the State Department to come up here and find out why they're making this kind of a commitment and they're not living up to it. I mean, Saudi Arabia gets billions and billions of dollars from the United States in oil revenues. We have, as I said before, protected them in the past. Kuwait, we saved their bacon in the first Iraq war mm -hmm. and, and, and the United Arab Emirates, I, I just can't understand why we're putting all that money in there and they made a commitment and they're not living up to it. Uh, and, and the State Department, if you say nobody's policing that, then that's a responsibility of our State Department. And uh, Mr. Ackerman, I hope that you'll contact uh, Mr. Lantos and Mr. Ross Layton and let's get somebody from the State Department up here and say, why in the Dickens, I'd like to use stronger language, or why in the heck Aren't you uh, policing that and holding their feet to the fire and making sure that they're, they're uh, uh, making good on their commitments? Well, and, and actually, that probably should have been my answer to, to ask the question to the State Department because that is their mission. I understand that they do, uh, do push them, but obviously there hasn't been any progress on, uh, on those pushes. Well, I can't understand why, if we're pushing them, we're not succeeding. I mean, every one of those countries that is at, are at risk if we aren't successful. Every no. one of them. That's right. And they've got a bigger stake in that than we do, in all That's probability, right. in, 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 the, in the Middle East. And I just cannot fathom why we're not beating the heck out of them, saying, you cough up your money or else uh, you're going to uh, reap the whirlwind. So uh, I would just like to suggest that I don't have any other questions, Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I, and, and Mr. Ross Layton, Ms. Uh, Ranking Member, but I, I, I wish we would call the State Department, get them up here and say, what's going on. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your service. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Thank you. Mr. Delahunt. Um, I, I, I would just note for the record, uh, directing this to my friend from Indiana, that uh, my uh, Chairman Ackerman and myself had a hearing that addressed these very concerns that you've articulated. It, it uh, was entitled A Coalition of the Willing. Uh, the point being that uh, we're here alone uh, 
when it comes to uh, providing funding. And I think Mr. Bowen uh, just observed that the $21 billion was a grant. It wasn't a loan. And I think with the exception of Japan uh, and possibly Korea, uh, all of the other uh, pledges that have been made but still have not been fully delivered upon are in the form of would, loans. Would I yield you, to yeah, the gentleman. Uh, uh, if you had a hearing on this, can you tell me who testified? Okay. Was it the State Department? And, if, and I just, I'd like to know what their answer was. My memory was it was Mr. Bowen. So uh, we haven't had anybody from State up to your knowledge then? Yeah, and David that's right, uh, David Satterfield appeal. We'll be happy to provide the transcript uh, well, I, to you. I'd like to hear directly from somebody at State that's responsible for this to find out what's going on. Thank you very much for yielding. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Bowen, I, I uh, again uh, welcome you um, and would note for the record that uh, you are uh, one of the few bright lights uh, in the saga of, uh, of Iraq. Thank you uh, for the fine work that you have done. Uh, recently, I noted that uh, uh, the administration has nominated or appointed a war czar. Uh, I think if you had been there at the beginning and had accepted the title Reconstruction Czar, uh, that maybe we wouldn't be having this hearing today, uh, it would have uh, proceeded uh, with a different result. But right, right. in any event, um, I'd, my memory is that you've testified elsewhere and have talked about uh, the need to uh, generate revenue, uh, obviously uh, with a almost exclusive reliance uh, on the oil sector. Uh, I think it's about 90 percent. 94 percent. 94 percent. What is the status of the hydrocarbon law? And hmm. members have expressed hmm. concerns to, to me, not just simply about its passage, but its support within Iraq, uh, because there are issues there at least in the opinion of some Iraqis, uh, that it would uh, provide uh, opportunities to foreign investors and foreign uh, national, uh, foreign private oil companies that would divert resources. Now, maybe that's incorrect. I don't know, but uh, I, don't know I, I don't. I don't know those particular details, but. First of all, in our latest quarterly report, we identified passage of the hydrocarbon law as a, an essential transition benchmark, along with the International Compact, which was approved, approved two, year, two weeks ago at Sharm El Sheikh, and also the re-energizing of a, a workable asset transfer system, which is, which is broken right now. Uh, the, but to put the hydrocarbon law question in context, remember that last September, it was deemed, its passage was deemed imminent, and then in November, and then it was appeared to be certain to be passed in December, and then it, then it passed out of the Council of Ministers in February. Uh, with the, uh, it's, there's four pieces to it, as right. I understand, and uh, on its way to the Council of Representatives with the four pieces anticipated to be passed, at least I was told during my February visit, by May. And we're in May. We're in May. Yeah, we're in May. And, uh, and so uh, I guess predicting anything about the hydrocarbon law, I think, uh, is probably unwise given that particular track record. It doesn't change the fact that, that uh, it's an important transition benchmark because the rules for investment have to be written and the rules for distribution have to be written for economic progress to occur. You know, um, this is a, 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 a quote, um, and again, I can't vouch for it, it, its accuracy, um, but let me read it. Um, Iraq will have this very complicated institution called the Federal Oil and Gas Council. Um, is that a creation of the, the draft hydrocarbon law? 
That's what I understand. It is a large-scale reform of management of oil and gas production and export in Iraq. And there are 15 independent operating entities right now that, that comprise the oil sector, the public oil sector in Iraq, Northern Oil Company, Southern Oil Company, uh, SOMO, the export entity, are the most notable ones. Uh, that's going to all change uh, with the creation of this centralized sort of contract approval uh, council. Well, what, what I find interesting, and again, let me just uh, proceed to the end of the quote, and it says that we'll have representatives from the foreign oil companies on its board. Is, is, is I, that I, accurate? I don't know anything about that. Because if that's true, one can envision, you know, representatives of Exxon Mobil, Shell, all of the major oil companies serving on this, uh, on this council, this Federal Oil and, and, uh, and Gas Council. Now, I yeah. if that's the case, what I'm concerned about, given the attitudes that we uh, see from the polling data uh, about the United States, one that was particularly disturbing was the 62 percent of the Iraqi people uh, indicating their, well, at least not their disapproval but that it was okay to, you know, uh, assault and kill American military personnel. If the Iraqi people, I dare say, start to become aware, if in fact this is accurate, I really want to underscore that, I don't know this, uh, but that we have representatives of major oil companies serving on a national uh, Oil and Gas Council that is executing contracts, um, we open ourselves, or we will be open to, not that we're doing this, but we'll be open to, they came in because of the oil kind of accusations. Mm -hmm. But again, you don't, I, you don't I, know anything about it? No, I don't know anything don't about know. it, but something that, uh, that uh, at least should uh, be questioned by, uh, by ourselves here in this Congress. And if anyone sitting in the, in the back there has any information on it, I know we'd all appreciate it. Uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it even works better without the uh, clip on the top. Um, Mr. Moen, thank you for your service and you. uh, the position of Inspector General uh, in uh, our agencies is just crucial. Uh, for accountability, for integrity, uh, and I appreciate your service. Thank you. Um, I additionally, uh, this morning, was so sorry uh, to learn, and I share the chagrin of Chairman Lantos, of uh, Congressman Burton from Indiana, um, our allies, particularly uh, our allies in the region, uh, need to be uh, participating uh, because the uh, negative consequence of failure in Iraq will most affect them. And I, I'm just really disappointed. I look forward, you had indicated, I was going to ask, but you've indicated that you'll be providing yes. uh, us a list of the, um, the different contributions, the pledges and contributions. Um, and indeed, uh, we want to thank the people of Japan, Korea, um, the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and it just, uh, I never cease to be uh, disappointed in the European Union. Uh, it, I just, because um, they will be catastrophically affected. Um, if, if we're not successful. Um, I also have the perspective, I've visited Iraq six times. Uh, I'll be going back um, in the next month. Um, I, I was so st um, startled on my visits to see the infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure, um, the electrical grids uh, that were antiquated, the lack of health care, the uh, lack of schools. Now there are uh, schools with six million children. Uh, I had uh, my oldest son serve for a year in Iraq, so I know from the ground um, the efforts of our forces, and I've never been proud of the American military. Uh, they've worked really hard on mm -hmm. infrastructure, uh, working to help build schools, to uh, deliver over a million uh, book bags to the children uh, of Iraq, uh, the efforts to renovate health clinics and open health clinics. Um, my son told me one of the greatest experiences he had was to 
um, provide um, water tanks for villages which had never had water tanks before with a contract by Iraqi contractors to uh, maintain uh, the water for the people um, in, in the villages that they were serving. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many positive um, stories out there, but I know that your um, role is to bring up both. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, another side is to see the progress on provincial reconstruction teams that you've referenced. And I've seen it personally in Afghanistan, uh, U.S., Korean uh, troops working together with local government officials. And can you uh, tell us again what the um, circumstance is in uh, Iraq with the PRTs? Yes, there are 10, uh, I call them standard PRTs, that are part of the program that began over a year ago. Uh, we did an audit of them in October, and, and uh, there, there were challenges with respect to resource, uh, resourcing them, staffing, and security. Security is, is simply a problem that will show up in analysis of any issue in Iraq. Uh, the, some of the PRTs are doing well. Uh, the, the one up in uh, Mosul is doing well. The, the, there are several that have a hard time getting out uh, at, and, and are concentrated down at Hilla. The one at Anbar is now operating, and it, 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 was, it was seriously um, compromised because of security uh, back uh, in, during my last visit. Uh, the Baghdad PRT is making a lot of progress. So, so the, the first tranche of, of PRTs, uh, mixed, mixed story as, as is with everything in Iraq, but, but generally accomplishing the mission and carrying out the important task of building capacity in the provincial councils. That's their, that's their job. Uh, the, the second tranche, the EPRTs, embed, the E standing for embedded, are, there are 10 of those, and they are going to uh, be part of brigades under brigade commander's guidance and, and have uh, some more, a more mobile capacity, but also similar purpose. There's, there's four of them in, uh, or I think five of them in, in Baghdad, so there, there's going to be a, a more uh, focused outreach in, to support the Baghdad security plan, the, uh, the build portion of it. And those, those uh, e EPRTs will, will uh, carry out that mission. But they're also in startup phase. I mean, they, they have their core uh, uh, capacities of four individuals, I think, on average, uh, but eventually will be up to 20 uh, by the summer. That's the plan. And, and I, uh, as I conclude, again, I'm, I'm so proud of what our troops are doing uh, the uh, representatives from civilian agencies of the United States. Uh, in my visits there, I've seen uh, the development of the satellite dishes that were illegal under Saddam Hussein. Now every house has one, sometimes it appears two. Uh, from a zero uh, of uh, cell phones, now there's six million. Uh, which eight, is eight million, actually. Part, and see, yeah. I'm understating. Um, thank you for your numbers. Yeah. But uh, there is hope. Um, it's not perfect, um, but um, I, I I want to thank you for your service. I want to thank our troops. I want to thank the American civilian uh, agencies. I want to thank the contractors for making a difference for the people of Iraq. I yield the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Inglis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bowen, just as a recap here, because I think I'm the last one, um, I wonder, wonder what the uh, we got to, we got to come more. Um, I wonder if you could just summarize for me the total that we're spending in Iraq, or we expect to spend in Iraq on reconstruction again, is how much? Uh, the, that's, I don't know how much eventually we will, but the amount that we have under oversight, and I include in relief and reconstruction security support, so that includes the Iraq Security Forces Fund, about $38 billion. Uh, the Iraq Security Forces Fund uh, total, uh, well, security spending, counting the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund and the Security Forces Fund, is about uh, 16 billion. Mm -hmm. So that gives you some sense. Uh, you know, almost, well, 40 percent or higher uh, is is security. And then, then the uh, there's 2.1 1 billion in, in the Commander's Emergency Response and Appropriated Funds, and another billion in seized. Uh, 21 billion in in the IRF and uh, several billion in the economic support fund that comprises that 38 billion. So it totals up to 38 billion. Uh, and of that, how much have we spent? Uh, well, of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, uh, almost 90% is spent. 
it, it varies among among the other tranches because they're they've come in in various supplementals and they've and also in uh, in, in fiscal year budgets. Uh, so, I, but of the Iraq Security Forces Fund, uh, I believe that about 80 percent of that is spent. Okay. So, in, in do you have any sense about uh, if, if our goal was to accomplish certain objectives, uh, we, we've spent 90 percent of the money maybe, but uh, I wonder if we have any sense of the objectives as opposed to the amount of money spent. I mean, are we, are we 90 percent complete on the objectives or are we uh, short of that because of the security issues involved? The latter. We're short of that. As we pointed out in a number of quarterly reports, something that we named two years ago, the reconstruction gap, this simply is an outflow of four reprogrammings that moved um, almost six billion of the earth among sectors, uh, primarily into the security sector, about uh, almost four billion into the security sector. And, and that money had to come out of other sectors, namely the water sector was cut by half, the electricity sector was cut, uh, oil and gas a little bit, uh, uh, some uh, economic development was cut, and, uh, and, and then all of it went into training Iraqi forces. Yeah. You know, uh, the $38 billion is the American effort. Order of magnitude of other partners' efforts uh, is in terms of pledges, what would that be? Well, well that's, that's what we've been talking about here this morning, the Madrid uh, pledges and, the, and, and the, the failure of, of a lot of that to come forward. Uh, I'm told the EU uh, has put in about $700 million in, uh, in grants, but we're going to have to give you the details on pledges and actual money coming forward. But, but the, 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 the Japanese have, have put in $1.5 billion in grants and $3.5 billion in loans. Uh, the, the United Kingdom has put in about a billion in a mix of loan and grant. Uh, and Korea uh, has, has, and, and Australia have also stepped up with, with, uh, with money. And, and also, actually, the Koreans are operating one of the PRTs. So that's an order, order of magnitude is maybe $5 billion. That's what it sounds like. Yes. Somewhere in that area. Yes. So of the, compared to the American effort, 38 billion, our partners might be at 5 billion in terms of expenditures. That's right. And uh, the, the reason I say 38 billion, because 90 of 90% 90 of it is, is spent, so therefore we really are getting close to the 38 billion, right? Well, 90% uh, of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, which is 20 billion, and about 80% of the Iraq Security Forces Fund, which is uh, uh, 10.8 billion. Right. And when you when you say the the, the estimate of five billion dollars being lost annually to corruption in Iraq, that's not our 38 plus no, the five. It's, it's not. All it's, of Iraqi. It is spending. all Iraqi money. And so some of that would be ours. Some of it would be Iraqi money. Or no, it's all Iraqi money. That's all Iraqi billion. money is yes, is the five billion dollar estimate. That's right. Okay. And that's that's a order of magnitude of their expenditures. I mean, as a a government, I mean, of and their their total budget is forty one billion this year. So the thought is, out of the forty one billion, perhaps five billion goes off to corruption. That's right. That's the estimate from the Commission on Public Integrity. Well, and of course, it is important for us to keep in mind that is our that's not our money. That's that's their money. Um, that's right. Uh, and of course, I, I guess some part of the thirty eight billion is not been spent as well as we might have hoped, I suppose, right. but um, but the order of magnitude of that waste is far lower than, say, the percentage of $5 billion over $41 billion. Right. Yeah. That's so, correct. Uh, uh, well, helpful. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. The gentle lady uh, from Texas, uh, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee, is recognized for five minutes. Again, Mr. Bowen, thank you so very much for your presence here and your service. And if my questions are rapid, I want your mother to know that I still appreciate uh, very much um, the leadership that you've given to this cause. Uh, I was detained in another hearing on the Gulf Coast recovery, so you can imagine um, the focus we've had today. I'm just going to start. I, I noticed uh, there are some questions that will tie into the one that I will make. For example, uh, it looks as if um, in the donors conference, I think you just answered that question of 13.5 billion, but maybe only about a quarter or 3.5 billion has been received. And certainly that concerns me and the corruption concerns me as well, because that seems to be an ongoing story. I indicated to you that I was there and have been there since, but I was there with uh, Ambassador Berman and really thank him for uh, the good intentions, but I think there were a lot of misdirections. One, of course, was the Bathis 
who, as I understand it, were just sheer civil servants, and we lost them. Can you um, just first question say that some of the failure that we have now is because of the sheer lack of leadership uh, in the Malachi government uh, with respect to um, being able to, one, uh, retain good civil servants, uh, the um, disagreement, if you will, of bringing back Bathis, uh, and um, uh, just simply not taking the leadership or statesmanship position to make hard decisions. Well, I think the, the issue that we've focused on within the government of Iraq that, that is a significant problem, if not the most significant problem, is the budget execution issue. Uh, as I've said, the United States is no longer funding the re recovery of Iraq, the reconstruction of Iraq. The $21 billion is largely spent. The burden of, of uh, funding, the c a continuing uh, recovery of that country, rests squarely on the shoulders of the, of the government of Iraq. Uh, when, when you, last year they spent about 22 percent of their capital budget. Uh, that uh, is not going to remedy the very real problems within their infrastructure that currently exist and, and cause low output of oil, that cause low uh, limited uh, generation of power on the grid, and also... Uh, uh, but if I may, does, yes. that, does that tie back to then a failed government system and with the leader who has been told, as I understand it, uh, made aware of these fractures in his government. Is it not a question of leadership that we have now in Iraq? I think that, that moves into uh, political and policy questions that are better directed at the State Department. My focus is on, on the economics, and the economic reality in Iraq is that funding is, is, is compellingly needed, uh, urgently needed, uh, across the board to, to bolster a very weak infrastructure that is, is continually attacked, by the way, by uh, insurgents. I mean, the, you, you may have seen today in the paper uh, the, the Baghdad grid was hit again. Uh, right. It's something we reported on repeatedly. And I've been there, and I forgive me, I'm going to go yeah. on to my next okay. question. I will take that as a, as, as a qualified yes, and I do respect the fact that you deal with the logistic. Let me just ask these series of questions, and then I'll yield back to you for the answers. How much involved are the large, the majors of our country in this whole question of the, the oil production and non-production? Uh, frankly, that has given the Iraq war a bad name, that this was only done because of the majors, uh, many of them that I represent, uh, and I know the needs, uh, that they were casting the die on this. Are they involved? Have they been training people? And what would be the reason for the resources not being moved as quickly as they should be? That's the oil resources. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether small and medium-sized businesses have had of the United States, um, have you seen uh, any opportunities through the logistical process for them to really get their foothold? Would they be helpful? Would there be helpful for joint ventures? Have you seen any work along those lines? Uh, my next question is dealing with the uh, utilities, electricity. That's one of the places you just spoke about the grid. But again, um, would any help from this, our neighbors, uh, Jordan and otherwise, since they're close by, be uh, effective in sort of getting electricity on more than two hours a day uh, beyond the violence? And you might speak to what we can do policy-wise to encourage the Bathists to be able to come back safely as civil servants, maybe to help the logistical problems that you've just edified. Okay. Uh, with respect to the Bathis issue, I think, again, that's a question of policy for the State Department, not with, not, uh, I, I focus on economics. The, the electricity issue, 23 percent of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund was spent on electricity, so it, it is an area of continued emphasis, continued new work. It's the area of the largest amount of work that's left to be done uh, in Iraq by the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund. The, the issue that, that uh, SIGR has focused on for a year uh, is infrastructure insecurity, and that is the, the, uh, the very grim reality that the, the 400 kV line, for example, from, ba from Beijing to Baghdad is down more than it's up, that the Baghdad grid gets hit continuously, and, and as a result of that uh, concerted effort, uh, the, the hours of power to Baghdad for the last nine months have stayed between four and six hours. While it's been higher in other parts of the country, uh, Baghdad, city of seven million, uh, as it survives largely on generators. There's a there's a, uh, a mini market uh, that's a, that's grown uh, uh, across the city in uh, the sale of generators. And and you know, when I fly out of Baghdad in the, at night in, in, in a Black Hawk, I, it looks like there's plenty of electricity, but it's not really as much driven by the grid as by these generators. 
So as to your small and medium-sized businesses, I'll, I'll need to get back to you with details, but I know that, that uh, there was an effort within, uh, within CPA contracting and subsequently Joint Contracting Command Iraq to address set-asides and smaller small business interests. Uh, the success of that, I'll have to, I'll have to query the uh, Joint Contracting Command, Command Iraq to get that. And I don't have any information about major oil and gas company involvement in the, in the oil sector. I thank the chairman. I the, uh, if by unanimous consent agreement, if my good friend from Illinois would uh, allow um, the gentleman from New Jersey to proceed for several minutes, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. I, I thank my friend for yielding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll go to you again. Yes. Thank you. I do have a meeting, regrettably, with a, uh, a Muslim leader at 12.30, so I have to get to that meeting. Let me just ask a couple of questions, if I could. Um, thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry I missed some of it, like many members was out uh, doing other things. I held a hearing last year on General George Casey's uh, statement or his, his rule dealing with the issue of foreign workers and trafficking. And uh, as you recall, a member, one of the people we had testified was General um, or Colonel Robert Boyles, uh, for, from the Air Force, who I think gave, you know, elaborated very well on what they plan to do uh, to try to mitigate uh, abuses of foreign workers. And uh, his order, frankly, uh, called for uh, to ensure that all contracts include a termination without penalty. The return of passports issue was important because very mm -hmm. often, as you know, uh, they would take right. the passport uh, and that made that person pretty much stateless in terms of his or her ability to move around. Uh, the, it would require prime and subcontracts to provide employees uh, with a signed copy of their employment contract that defines the terms of their employment. Uh, it would also provide for a sufficient and adequate living space, as you recall. And I'm wondering how well or poorly uh, that order is being carried out. And let me just say parenthetically uh, that it, it is really a pleasure and a, an honor to see uh, Hillel uh, Weinberg, uh, who's who uh, served with great distinction on this committee uh, for decades. And all of us who knew him greatly respect him, and uh, so good to see you back. Hello. I'm fortunate to have him on my staff. I so know, thank I you. know. That is yeah. our loss, your gain. Yes. <laughs> but please, if you could, I mean. It's a good question. It's one I ran into right away in 2004 when I, when I got on the ground and really addressed in uh, the summer of 2004 with the Defense Contract Management Agency about the practices of a company called Tamimi. I don't know if you've run into that, that company, but, but they were, it's a Kuwaiti company that was subcontracting with Kellogg Brown and Root and was doing exactly uh, what you just described. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was, it was a challenging issue, was some contentious matters, uh, but uh, there were, I think we made progress then. Obviously, we didn't solve it. Uh, because as you, you've heard and just recited, uh, it, that, that practice continues elsewhere. I don't know about the, this particular order. I'll need to follow up if, uh, uh, if do you do some could, research. Because, because it's all about implementation. And it is. It seems to me that, that from a force protection point of view, from the exploitation of the labor force point of right. view, uh, I mean, it's a lose-lose everywhere if, right. if we don't pay careful attention to this. The order was a, was a fine order. It covered all the bases. It's just a matter of whether or not uh, it is implemented. And what what was the date of that uh, April order? April of 06. And we had a hearing on it, and frankly, the answers that were given, uh, while they were well-meaning, uh, were not availing, uh, you know, in terms of how this was going to be rolled out. You know, 35,000 foreign workers is no small number of people. And, and the recruiters, the brokers in Jordan and elsewhere, uh, were doing a job, uh, you know, of, of tricking, deceiving, lying and, and, and sometimes coercing, but especially defrauding individuals into thinking uh, that this is what it would be like once they got to Baghdad or some other point in, in Iraq, only to find that the, the pay was nowhere near what they were promised and they were working pretty much in involuntary servitude uh, and slave-like conditions in some cases. So, yeah. so the order is right, whether or not it's being implemented remains the issue. And, and who signed that order? Who uh, is Casey. Casey. And Colonel Boyles was one of those who implemented it or began implementing it. And uh, I've asked some questions before, still haven't gotten the answers, and it seems to me, you know, okay. the money should, should... We'll follow up. I appreciate that. Thank you. And You're if we welcome. could make that part of the record, if we could, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mansoula. Uh, the, the gentleman from uh, Illinois, Mr. Manzullo. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate your, your perseverance. 
Um, I don't know why you do it except you love America with a deep and intense passion. Yes, sir. Have a That's desire why. to help people. Um, I, I read through your testimony. I'm sorry that I wasn't here. And also the uh, Congressional Research Service uh, did a memorandum on, on the money. And, uh, and it's, it's, you know, there's so many programs going on. Um, you, you wonder, the bureaucrats suck up all the money. Uh, then they have to file reports as to where the money is going, and you wonder how many really gets down, how much gets down to the individuals. Uh, but let me uh, let me recall to you, or recall to myself, I was at a recent hearing, and an administrative official, uh, whose name escapes me, uh, was all excited. He said Americans can look forward to buying Iraqi-made manufacturing items. And, um, and he said that, I mean, he was really excited. Uh, he doesn't represent um, Winnebago County, Illinois, which has lost 14,000 manufacturing jobs and uh, has the highest um, percentage of manufacturing jobs per capita uh, for any county uh, in excess of 250,000, uh, with the exception of Wayne County, which is, which is Detroit. In, I spend most of my time on manufacturing issues. I had heard either from General Petraeus or, or it was sometime around when the, before the surge began that the United States was going to spend um, resources uh, trying to restart Iraq's manufacturing uh, sector. And I, I noticed nothing mentioning manufacturing in the CRS report nothing in particular in yours. Uh, what, can, what can you tell me about that? Well, there are, it's a multi-front effort to try and, and, and get the private sector manufacturing and state-owned enterprises, frankly, uh, restarted. Uh, and, and it's been a four-year challenge. There, there is a new, uh, a, a new initiative, relatively new, that's been ongoing uh, out of the Pentagon under Deputy Undersecretary of Defense Paul Brinkley's leadership to, to try and, and engage uh, the startup of Iraqi factories wherein the, the, the Department of Defense purchases some of uh, the, the output of it and also trying to connect up U.S. businesses uh, to, to, uh, to, to be purchasers. Um, it's, he, to be he, purchasers. Told, he told me in this last trip, when I, I saw him last week, uh, that he that there's four factories uh, that that he's gotten going and he has a plan to 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 bring 20 more online. No, who, who is it that you're talking this about? This is the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense. And who is that? Paul Brinkley. Undersecretary of Defense for Business Transportation. I would very much business, like to know business business transformation. Sorry. I would very much like to know, and the American people would like to know, um, and my manufacturers and factory workers would like to know yeah. if the United States is rebuilding factories in Iraq training people to work in those factories, to manufacture items in order to sell them back to the people of the United States. I mean, I think that's, that's outrageous. If that's the goal, if that's the goal, this is an outrage. Because there are enough people in Iraq to buy their own products, and enough, yeah, and enough countries out there that should be helping us out to buy those products. There, right, right now he's he's facilitating the process. Not, I'm told, spending U.S. dollars to do it. Do you? Do you, well, he's spending his time on it. Well, I, th I, I mean, think he has a staff and his no. energy. I mean, I, I I would like to meet with him. Uh, do you work with him on a as part of the of, of your of your uh, job? I, here? I meet with him. Uh, I don't work work directly. Is with anybody him. here from the State Department that works with Mr. Brinkley? He's from the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense. And but I but I can provide you his contact information. I would I would very much like to talk to him. Okay. I would like you to furnish me, if possible, any documentation involving the restarting of manufacturing in Iraq. I don't recall if before the war we imported that much from Iraq, but I think it's absolutely stupid. To think that the way to reconstruct manufacturing in Iraq is to provide markets for Iraqi-made goods here. I mean, doesn't this sound strange? When there are enough countries in the world that are next door that you don't have to worry about transportation uh, and enough people in Iraq to buy the products themselves? And I want to know what these products are. I want to know if they're in competition with stuff made in America. Those are valid questions, don't you think? Yes, sir. I mean, don't you think it would be outrageous for Americans to rebuild Iraqi factories that we perhaps bombed? 
Well, and uh, then and then to turn around and create more competition, and then to have the prices uh, somehow finessed so that Americans would be buying cheaper stuff in order to rebuild capacity in Iraq. And for how long would that go on? I mean, how can a how can a manufacturing sector uh, be reconstituted if it's if it depends upon exports? I'll, I'll, I'll provide you his, his uh, contact information, and I'm sure he'll be glad to come give you a briefing on what he's doing. Could you do that? Then, who's from DOD here? Is from, anybody here from DOD? Okay. Well, I asked some good questions, didn't I, Chairman? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any more questions, Mr. No, Manzolo? No, we'll give you all the time you, know, you, you know, want. You know, I live all my, my life in factories and trying to keep manufacturing here. Thank you. No, but I, I would just note that I think we did rebuild some factories in Europe after the war. Uh, I understand your point. I think, uh, again, and I think you know that I'm an advocate for... A right. uh, little um, bit different situation. I mean, why would the administrative officials say Americans will look forward to buying goods made in Iraq. I mean, why do you talk about the other countries of the world buying Iraqi products? Just, just a thought. Well, we'll, Thank we'll you. take your thought and, and reflect on it. Uh, the gentleman from uh, California, uh, Mr. Jim Costa. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's uh, indeed, uh, I think, timely that we have this uh, briefing this, this morning or now into the afternoon with regards to how taxpayers' dollars in our country have been spent in Iraq, and obviously there's a lot of concern. By your own report that I have here, uh, as you noted, Congress appropriated $21 billion in the Relief and Reconstruction Fund, and as you state uh, today, more than 98% of those taxpayer, taxpayers' dollars have been obligated, more than 84% have been expended. Uh, much has been discussed uh, this morning uh, about corruption and the challenges with corruption in these dollars, uh, these hard-earned American taxpayer dollars that have been allocated for the reconstruction purpose. Uh, last night I was in an in a interesting meeting with the Iraqi ambassador to the United States, and uh, we had a, a wide-ranging discussion, but uh, one of the questions I put to him was um, how much progress we could expect in the next six months and the next 12 months in terms of this uh, Iraqi government gaining uh, not only uh, further stability but making good on its promises to not just disband the militias but get reconstruction going, getting the economy going. When, in my opinion, based upon my visits and everything that I've read, uh, corruption continues to be uh, if not endemic, a way of life. And he responded and, and got animated, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but uh, that corruption was perhaps, in his opinion, the greatest one of, if not the one of the greatest problems that they were dealing with. And he went on to further explain that it wasn't just corruption within their own uh, segments of the economy and within the government, but corruption within American contractors as well and how contracts were issued. Uh, I'd like to know, as the Inspector General, whether or not you have been able to place any handle. I mean, we're now being asked to put another $3.5 billion with this supplemental if uh, we get it approved, and I hope we do, uh, For even though I have certain issues, but I still think we have to, have to fund our troops. Nonetheless, uh, what percentage of, of corruption have you been able to discern out of the $21 billion that of taxpayers' dollars that we have appropriated and any other monies that have been expended either by uh, our allies or by the Iraqi government revenues itself. Do you have any handle on this? Yes, we, we are focused on that issue and we have 78 ongoing cases uh, and 28 of them are at the Department of Justice under prosecution now. The, the, uh, the uh, fact is, is there's a distinction between levels of corruption that's, that's very substantial there's on the Iraqi little side. Little corruption, mid-sized corruption, well, big corruption. Well, I'm talking about the difference between Ara corruption on the Iraqi side and the U.S. And side. corruption on our side, okay. Yes. Uh, on the Iraqi side, it's endemic, as you said. Uh, and it's, it's uh, upwards of $5 billion annually and, uh, and, and um, something that, um, that the anti-corruption entities in Iraq are having a very difficult time making any progress on. On the U.S. side, based on our work to date, 
the corruption uh, has not been a significant component, fraud I'm talking about, of, of, the, of the U.S. Iraq reconstruction experience. As I said the, the, earlier, the, over the course of this year, we expect to see more cases coming forward, so that picture will become... But these um, 27 cases you made reference to, they're looking at corruption, and these right. are American contracts? That's correct. And so we don't, as of this point, then yet clearly know. Uh, I mean, we know what those companies did, how much their contract alo was allocated for, I suspect, in, in dollars. Right. We, we, we have a whole variety of allegations, some large, some small. Uh, but as I said, to date, based on, on what we've accomplished, what's, what's been done, the, the U.S. Uh, component of corruption, the component within the U.S. program is relatively small. Do you include, um, I don't want to say cost overruns, but they're a way of padding, padding yeah, that, costs? That, that, that falls under waste, I think, but we do have cases that, that, that verge from waste into fraud, and we're looking at those. Uh, the, uh, but, but at the same time, our audits and our inspections more demonstrably note that waste has been a problem. And when can you delineate for the committee uh, uh, a better handle in terms of the actual numbers, both as it relates to fraud and waste, both uh, Iraqi and U.S.? And the, the, our investigations are ripening, and, and I think through the course of this year, uh, we will have uh, information we can provide publicly to you about uh, progress on those. Uh, on the waste front, we are engaging pursuant to our extended mandate in the, in the uh, 2006 Iraq Reconstruction Accountability Act to pursue a forensic audit-like review of the Iraq Relief and Reconstruction Fund, and we're doing that by doing audits of major contractors and sectors. Our first report will be out in the next quarter on Bechtel. Uh, we have ongoing reviews of Blackwater, uh, Parsons, uh, DynCor, and we have others uh, in the queue. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired, but it, this is something that I believe that the committee needs to continue to follow on and to get a timely report so that we can get a better handle on um, the level of, of corruption and waste that is taking place both uh, on the Iraqi side and uh, within U.S. companies as well. Uh, clearly, uh, we have enough challenges uh, in Iraq as it is today without adding to the uh, problems that uh, waste and fraud create uh, as we're trying to, to make things right there. I, th I thank the gentleman and I would defer to the ranking member if she has any additional questions or comments. Thank you so much, Mr. Delahan. As you pointed out, you've uh, already delved uh, on this uh, issue in your uh, subcommittee and done a, a good job of that. And we commend again uh, a wonderful Inspector General for great work that he's done. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Bowen. Thank you. And just let me uh, echo those sentiments. Uh, as I've stated on multiple occasions, uh, Mr. Bowen, you've been a terrific. You've done terrific service for your country. With the addition of Mr. Weinberg, you enhance the uh, professionalism uh, of your staff. And let me make a final request. I intend to ask uh, Mr. Ackerman, who chairs the Middle East uh, subcommittee uh, to examine or uh, to conduct a hearing in conjunction with uh, my subcommittee into the Hydrocarbon Act as it's currently uh, constituted. And since oil revenue, as you indicate, is amounts to 94 percent of uh, the revenue source for the Iraqi the government to operate and, and reconstruct, we'd like to know uh, as much about the Hydrocarbon Act uh, as we can so that at some point in time in the, in, in the future we can speak about it uh, and discuss it among ourselves or in a, obviously in a, in a public forum as well um, so that we're not blindsided by possible suggestions or accusations uh, that uh, this is all about oil, big oil, uh, and that was the motivation uh, to go into Iraq. So if, I don't know if that's within uh, the, your purview, but if you could provide uh, the committee 
uh, with appropriate uh, names and contact information that uh, representatives of the administration uh, who might have those answers could give us, I think we would welcome that. Yes, sir. I will do that. Thank you. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.